anybody that supports Donald Trump, I think is fucking crazy. And that's like 85% of Republicans right now. Why do you like Trump over Biden? Well, Trump did way better with the economy. What did Trump do for the economy? Uh, tax cuts. They like Trump because he represents a real anger that people have and they want to break. It. And Trump is the guy saying, I'll break it for you. Is that the best president in my entire lifetime in the United States? For a lot of people, life just works better on rails. There are people who it's like, if you throw them into the wind, they are lost. The Republican Party is on the verge of collapse. Stephen Bonnell, a.k.a. Destiny, thank you so much for coming on the Iced Coffee Hour. You're one of the biggest streamers across all platforms. You've appeared on podcasts like PBD Podcast. You've debated Alex Jones, Ben Shapiro. That was a recent debate that blew up. It's like six million views in a week. Mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson recently that hasn't came out yet. We're going to talk about this. Fresh and Fit, Whatever Pod. You've debated basically everybody which I admire a lot. Some people call you Ben Shapiro of the left because you talk very fast and you're incredibly intelligent. And by some people, you mean the title you put on my YouTube video, okay? <laughs> title, you should have called him the destiny of the right. Did, did but, you yeah. feel okay that by that? Funny. Was that all yeah, right I by you? Fun. That's fun, okay, yeah. cool. Well, thank you so much for coming yeah, on, man. I really, really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thanks for having me. So the yeah. Ben Shapiro debate. This is, I feel like, what everyone's been talking about. It's highly anticipated. We brought it up to you if you would debate Ben. You said yes. That clip went viral. We brought it up to Ben when we had him on if he would debate you. He said yes. That clip went viral. How did this all come about? Uh, I'm kind of friendly, friends, friendly with Lex. And I think I did a Jubilee show. And Jubilee asked me at the end, could you film like a call out to Ben Shapiro and maybe we could host it? Lex saw that and Lex was like, hey, do you think I could get this debate? And I love Jubilee, but Lex is like the guy that would let me have a two to three hour uninterrupted conversation. Jubilee will shoot three hours of content and they cut it down to like Mm -hmm. 45 minutes. Um, And I just feel like Lex's platform would have been really good for that. So I was like, well, if you think you can get the debate, then go for it. And then Lex did a bunch of work in the background and he, yeah. Got the debate. Was that hard to schedule with Ben? I probably, but I, Lex said all of that. He up, not facilitated me, so. all no. of it. Yeah. Were you nervous for the debate with Ben? Uh, not particularly. No. How did you prepare for that? Did you just go in, or did they give you topics to talk about and you could research them? I think it was going to be a pretty broad conversation. So we went over. It must have been like ten topics in like two hours, and a lot of the Trump-related stuff is more. I'm just kind of like curious because it's such an easy topic on my end and such an indefensible topic on their end. I'm just more curious, like how are you going to try to navigate this particular thing? Mm-hmm. Um. But I've been doing a lot of political stuff for the past like four to six months now, uh, ever since I started Vivance and stopped talking to Red Pillar. So, um, yeah, my brand has been pretty plugged in politically. So yeah. I felt like pretty OK to go on. I am interesting. You think that Trump stuff is indefensible. Yeah, I'm obviously. Right. Yeah, of course. Yeah, easily. Huh. So, well, I just think that like half of the nation, well, not half, but uh-huh. a pretty, what is it, 40 percent approval rating for Trump? Um, I know that the conservative approval rating is always very, 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 very high. Yeah. My general thought is that I feel like it's somewhat defensible. 40 percent of the general population is somewhat in support of something. But that's beside the point. We yeah. want to know. I find for the Trump yeah. stuff, I would just say most people just don't know the facts of anything that have happened. So when you don't know the facts, you think that like, oh, yeah, well, people are indicting him for no reason. Everybody hates him for no reason. People say he stole the election for no reason. They try to say there's an insurrection for no reason. But when you actually lay out all the facts, then it's like, okay, oof. But if you go up against Ben Shapiro, I mean, his whole thing is like facts. At least that's what he claims. So don't yeah, you but think the thing that he would at least have a different angle to attack He criticizes Trump a lot, though. The thing he does is criticize Ben Shapiro Trump. took – this is the funny part is that when you go to the people that know – their defenses start to look, in my opinion, very wacky. So Ben Shapiro's defense of Trump was that he graves him on a big curve, so he Mm -hmm. gives him a lot of leeway, and that Trump would try to take over the government as a dictator, which he tried to do, but Ben feels like the guardrails are strong enough that he won't be able to do it even if he tries a second time. Hmm. So it's more of an admission than like most people will make. I find that insane, but yeah. Do you think Ben was the hardest debate you've ever had? Um, probably not, but not because he, not because it was a dumb debate, or not because he didn't know anything, but just because the we, it was just kind of like surface level and everything. We kind of like hit topics, um, and then moved to the next one on kind of a surface level way. So I'm sure if we had like a two or three hour conversation on like one or two topics, it would be far more challenging. Yeah. Would you have preferred that to go deeper on each topic? Because I noticed it seems as though some of these topics are only like 10, 15 minutes long. They yeah, give you a few minutes. Him a few minutes, another few minutes between both of you, and then it was on to the next. There was a part where Ben was like, here, let me actually draw this out for you. And he looks for like a pen and a piece of paper to be able to draw this line curve of job production between like Joe Biden and Donald Trump. But then De- Lex was like, all right, we got to like take this back. We're getting a little too granular. Yeah, the um, I would definitely prefer that. But it's also like it's like a first conversation. So mm-hmm. you have to buy a little bit of trust with the other person. Um, I think it was a I think it was a good conversation for a first conversation. Are you going to have another one? Hopefully. 
We'll see. There's nothing like planned right now, though. What's different when you debate Ben versus somebody else? Nothing. I try to take a similar approach to everybody in that, like, there's a dynamic approach, uh, depending on the person that I'm talking to, how radical or not radical they are, how reasonable or not reasonable they are, how much of a showman they are versus how much of a sick the facts kind of person they are. So Ben, I'll have like a unique approach to Ben, but it all stems out from like the same type of dynamic approach I take to everybody. The one thing that you mentioned in that debate that I did notice, and I noticed a lot of people doing this, is you would make a point and they would counter that point by not addressing the point, but saying, well, we shouldn't focus on this. We should focus on all these other things. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate something like that and get someone back to the point? It seems like a lot of times they'll avoid the point entirely. Well, there are two different concepts you're talking about that sound similar, but they're totally different. Mm. Uh, in the in, in terms of policy, that was the one that I was focused on with Ben and that I feel like sometimes conservatives will, I, I call it like the conservative merry-go-round, yeah. where anytime you want to address a thing, they want to address another thing. Or if you want to make an incremental change somewhere, they'll say, we can't do that incremental change because it doesn't fix everything. So we should only focus on this. And that's very frustrating to me. So for instance, you might say something like red flag laws for firearms, the ability to flag people and say, this guy's probably a danger. Maybe we should do something about it. They'll say like, like, oh, well, that doesn't fix gang violence, so we shouldn't do this. It's like, okay. Uh, or I think the examples that we were going through in that conversation were in schools. Yes. I think air conditioning and food availability are like two of like the easiest, most data-driven, help, helpful things to children in school. And that would be a thing that could help a little bit. But Ben's point, which is true, is that, well, this isn't going to fix the schools. And I'm like, well, of course not, but it helps. Uh, well, we need to fix like families or whatever, right? Correct. And I feel like anytime you want to focus on like a, a particular problem or try to help in, a, in an incremental way, Conservatives will hop back one or two steps and go, well, it doesn't fix everything, so we need to do this radical society-changing thing like enforcing shotgun marriages, I think was his that was solution. Saying, like, yeah. Ah, okay, well, this feels— Recommending yeah. shotgun yeah. marriages. Yeah. Recommending, yeah. But I will say that's different than in a debate when somebody won't ever address a point you're bringing sure. up, which I don't think Ben ever did that. I don't think he like avoided no. addressing a particular point. Yeah? No, what I thought was really interesting is it sounded— honestly kind of like a therapy session of like two like a, like a wife and a husband that have been together for a super long time and they're having struggles in the relationship like you would say man i just feel like conservatives always do this they do the conservative merry-go-round and they don't attack the issues where they have the control and then ben was like i feel like liberals always ignore the iceberg they're just focused on the thing that's above the waterline yeah. when there's this whole massive problem underneath it mm -hmm. and it was really funny just like the the difference in I don't know. Yeah, the reality is you have to come at it from both ends. But anytime you talk to somebody on the left or the right, they only want to address their end and then vent their frustrations about the other end, which is very frustrating. So anytime you try to bring somebody a little bit over to the middle where it's like, yeah, uh, the family structure is incredibly important, obviously, for a whole bunch of different predictive things in society. But also there's incremental changes you can make in schools, too. We can do both. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be both. But people get really hung up on their particular thing. Yeah. Who do you think won the debate? Um, I don't know. I mean, like I said, I don't think it was like a huge debate. Like, like, I think we kind of like bounced out. through topics. I don't think that we, yeah, resolutely concluded on a particular thing where it's like, you're wrong about schools or you're wrong about Trump or you're wrong about whatever. It was just kind of our different perspectives in terms of how we viewed those things. What so. do you think Ben would say? Do you think he would say he won? Um, I don't know. Maybe. I'm not sure. I feel like people on the left would probably just say you won. People on the right would probably say yeah. he won. Um, maybe, yeah, depends. People, Some people on the left will say I won because my points were better on like Trump or something. Or they'll say I lost because I needed to push him way harder on other things. And I'm sure there are people on the right that say, oh, Ben crushed him because he said the things that uh, they agree with. And there might be some people on the right who's like, Ben didn't do as good because he should have crushed him on these points or whatever. Yeah. You posted on Twitter yesterday that you finally dressed up for a podcast or interview. And it was a photo of you and Jordan Peterson. Yeah. I want to know how that conversation went. Was it more of a debate or a conversation that's not released yet? Because it was uh -huh. just filmed yesterday. I'm assuming this is probably going to be released before that. Maybe we could get some teasers. Some teasers. Uh, I didn't expect him to stand up. We got into a physical fight okay. uh, about 45 minutes in, which who was won? crazy. Um, it's hard to say who won exactly because he... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was definitely... It went from like conversation to like debate to conversation to debate to conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I think I was pretty happy with the level of combativeness. He seems like he's somebody that's able to ratchet it up and then kind of like bring it back a little bit and not be completely unhinged. I'll say there was like a 30-minute section on climate change, which I wish oh, I could wow. have been more prepared for because I was not ready for it hmm. to be a debate on climate change. He asked me for an example of like... Uh, like in capitalism, have you ever, do you know what an externality is? Yeah. 
Okay, so in um, when, when you're trying to deal with a policy, uh, you, you might do a particular thing, or there might be a thing that happens, and there's an external effect that's not sure. accounted for in your system. Sure. Uh, so like pollution, in my opinion, that's like the go-to good example of an externality, right? If you pollute a ton, you don't have to pay for it. So that's external to your system, and it's not factored into the cost. And as soon as I brought that up as an example, like, oh, well, here's an externality where government can help sometimes, then it was like, okay, well— the WEF and where they're trying to make a seat bugs and Bill Gates and billionaires and the global elite and the UN are all trying to do this. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. And then we did like a 30 minute thing on climate change. So, yeah. Why does he go from pollution to the World Economic Forum and all these other places? Like, what is their involvement in that? As Graham and I definitely know, and you may know too, that running a business is incredibly challenging and trying to stay organized with a bunch of different spreadsheets and softwares can oftentimes end up taking more energy than what it's worth. But with today's sponsor, NetSuite, all you have to do is remember these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and 1. 37,000, because that's how many companies have switched to NetSuite and stopped doing things like typing in manual data entry and searching throughout scattered information. 25, because NetSuite has spent 25 years helping businesses drive down their costs. And 1, because NetSuite Suite is an all-in-one solution that allows you to manage all of your KPIs or key performance indicators with one efficient system. NetSuite can help reduce mistakes from manual data entry. And trust me, if you've ever done manual data entry, there will always be mistakes and prevent the busy work from scaling with your business. So get a full picture of your business and help make better decisions faster. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPIs checklist for free at netsuite.com slash iced. Again, that's netsuite.com slash iced to get your free KPIs checklist. Again, for free, netsuite.com slash iced. Graham, did I hear that correctly? NetSuite.com slash iced? The link is also down below in the description. Thank you so much, NetSuite. And back to the episode. Why does he go from pollution to the World Economic Forum and all these other places? Like, what is their involvement in that? Uh, What what is he saying that they're doing that's negatively affecting society? I mean, I get the eating bugs thing. I've looked into this. It seems very interesting. It seems like crickets are a good source of protein. Oh, boy. You could feed a lot of people. You disagree? No, I just, you're going to get these people in your comment section now. I feel like it's, it's... (laughs) Do you, it's not, it's not controversial. It's like it, it, this seems like a. Like, fact I don't thing. know about the crickets. Can you elaborate? Cr- crickets are like the highest source of protein that you could get. They reproduce. Well, what does that very... have to do with WEF? I don't quite know. I want you to eat bugs. Yeah, I, I guess they're they're like Bill Gates and the WEF, and this is like some high level. I I, I don't quite know. Is it, seeming to think that we should force people to eat bugs. <laughs> because it's, that way you'll it's, own nothing yeah, and be happy exactly but it, it's every... a way it's a way that you could feed the planet the amount uh of waste that methane goes, from cows exactly from cows mm-hmm. or raising meat is so absurdly high but you but you need that for certain vitamins and proteins and you get the same thing with crickets for a fraction of the cost you could grow crickets anywhere they reproduce very quickly um, I guess it's the idea. Of just, but how, we yeah, haven't America's, tried this on large scale yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, what if we and start having these crickets. crazy cricket colonies and they start gaining intelligence and then take over the human? We just don't know. I don't know. I think if you want to solve a lot of hunger, it's probably crickets. It's probably insects. I think people are going to say, like, come up with, like, a class problem, you know, what I mean? with that. Like, the people on the bottom are just, like, you know, <laughs> eating crickets, eating crickets but you don't while look the at people lobster. on the top get, like— Look at lobster, though. Lobster used to be, like, the, the cockroach of the sea. Lobster did not used to be the culinary luxury so that it is now. So crickets are going to be the delicacy? They could be. We don't know this. But lobster okay. is now a delicacy. And beforehand, it would be like, oh, you eat lobster? <laughs> That's like for peasants. I'm saying a lot of things have changed. Interesting. But what, but what are your thoughts on that? This is where I'm at right now for our political stuff. I think that um, probably it's probably true for everything, actually. But... You know how you might have like 10 or 15 different beliefs. You might think a thing about climate change. You might think a thing about vaccines. You might think a thing about the presidency. Uh, I think people like to have this idea that they have rational justifications for all of their different beliefs. But I think what actually happens is I think there's like constellations of belief systems. And I think you just inherit these from whatever social group you're in. And when you go into that social group and you inherit the constellation of beliefs, all of these beliefs kind of sort of implicitly rest on every other belief. And it's not really changeable because if you pull out like one thing, It's like a Jenga tower. It all collapses. Mm. So when you talk to somebody, unfortunately, today about a particular subject, because of how homogenous and how huge these like political groups have gotten, I think you can make a lot of predictions about things that they believe about other things. And it all just kind of goes together. So if I ask you, for instance, about uh, what you think about Andrew Tate, if you think that in Romania, if you think that the charges are trumped up and it's not fair what they're doing to Andrew Tate, you probably also believe that the WF is trying to control your life. You probably also think the UN is like a corrupt organization. You probably think that we should support Russia over Ukraine in the war. You probably support Donald Trump. You probably think the mRNA vaccines were rushed and are making us unhealthy. You probably like there's like 
30, you probably think like trans people are fake. There's like 20 different beliefs that like everybody inherits just on their social groups. And that's how I feel about it. So when climate change comes up, well, obviously, this is the ruling global elite billionaire class that's trying to force us to, they'll quote that one article, uh, own nothing and be happy. So we're right. run our society. They all want to eat crickets. Yeah. yeah, Klaus Schwab. Oh, that's don't it. even get me started on it, right? <laughs> it's always, yeah, it's always that type of thing, I think, yeah. That's really interesting. Chris Williamson brought this up when we collaborated with him, but he said, if he knows about three things about a person and their ideology, and then he can pinpoint every other ideology. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really respect them. He feels like they, they're looking at life through an ideological lens rather than as an independent thinker, which I kind of agree. That's true. How dangerous is it when you notice yourself slipping into these, I guess, ideologies? Mm -hmm. um, and how do you prevent that? So I wouldn't say I lose respect for people. I think it depends on the kind of person you are. I think there's something that's really, really important to keep in mind. There's a couple of important things. Is one, we live in worlds where you need some sort of like ideological congruency with the people around you or else you can't survive, mm -hmm. right? So for me, and, and you can probably find me saying this, I'll say things like similar to what Chris Williams says, like I shouldn't be able to predict every single belief you have based on two tweets. That's fucking pathetic, okay? In my mm -hmm. opinion. But I'll say that. But then also, I'm not surrounded by a whole bunch of people that are kind of enforcing that ideological homogeneity. Like, what if it was the case that I've got really strong opinions about Israel-Palestine that are probably out of sync with a lot of younger people today? Mm -hmm. Well, if I was going to school and I was 21, would I want to make those opinions known? Like, what if that means losing half my friend group? And you can't lose half a friend group. You'll probably lose your whole friend group because now you can be able to make choice on who to hang out with. And the, the decision for an individual in like a social group that requires some level of cohesion, that's gonna be a really difficult decision to make. So I, I'm understanding of people that, you know, kind of have buy-ins to their social groups and need to believe certain things to maintain membership with those social groups. I'm, I'm sympathetic towards it. The less sympathy happens when I'm talking to like YouTubers or political mm -hmm. figures. I don't like partisan people or people that have a strict adherence to a particular ideology in the face of all other things uh, and all other like data or evidence. So like, for instance, like, I don't think it's bad to support political figures. I think that's fine. But let's say tomorrow, the most 100% rigorous fact finded factual, everything about this study, it was just true. You knew it was true if you read it. And it says that like socialism is the best way to organize society. Okay. Personally, I'm a capitalist, but if that study came out, okay, well, fuck it. I guess I'm a socialist. But if it really is the best thing, that's fine. But if you take somebody who's really smart, in my opinion, Ben Shapiro is really smart, but he's a conservative pundit. There's no way that he can ever make any concessions towards that particular thing because his audience are all conservative. He's going to lose his paycheck, his money, his business, all of his employees, livelihoods will be threatened. Um, yeah, that's – yeah. So when, when it comes to people that are partisan, I think that I'm sympathetic towards individuals. But when it comes to larger figures, I'm less sympathetic because I feel like you guys are getting paid big bucks to do this particular stuff. You should be a little bit more fearless when it comes to exploring kind of the edges of your ideology or pushing into other ideologies and yeah. You know. That's really interesting. And I also want to be sure that everyone here knows – I, I'm not quoting him directly when he says he loses respect for people when he can pinpoint all of their beliefs based off of three. You're just kind of right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You were saying that you don't think Ben would alter his opinion because he's motivated by profit to think a certain way. Or there's a bit of audience capture there because he's like the conservative guy, right? Yeah. He is the conservative guy. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but even if facts came out that disproved everything he was saying and they were objective axiomatic facts, he would not change his opinion. I want to know if you think that means that Ben is a bad faith political pundit. Bad faith is... On a there's a spectrum of bad faith, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that anybody that is like ideological partisan has some adherence to that political ideology and there might be some level of bad faith. Um, but I mean, it's going to depend on how you flex it. So, for instance, I might talk to some conservatives that they will bury their head in the sand when it comes to anything that Donald Trump has done. Mm -hmm. That's the norm for conservatives. Ben will at least acknowledge it all. But then, in my opinion, if I were to say he would be bad faith in any way, I would say that the excuses that he makes for Trump are way out there that he would never make for somebody on the left. So if Biden were to say, like, oh, I'm going to tell, you know, Kamala Harris to change the election results or I'm going to call all these states and say, hey, guys, you need to change your uh, electoral college votes. Uh, you know, I think it would be over. I think mm -hmm. Ben would say, like, this is obviously one of the most corrupt things I've ever seen in my entire life. But I think he's actually said that about, like, about hunter biden you know in comments relating to hunter and joe biden and it's like okay well why are you so quiet on like kushner you know penning two billion dollar deals with the saudis after his place in government that in an office that trump created for him by the way mm -hmm. like what joe um you know joe biden's son hunter biden isn't even involved in government like i feel like there's a lot of double standards at play there and i think it comes down to political ideology in my opinion but I, to say that ben is bad faith i mean I, there's it's all in a spectrum i would say yeah hmm. and what about jordan peterson 
Um, I feel like Jordan Peterson is in the constellation of beliefs, and he's very much up there and out there. <laughs> That's Interesting. my feeling, yeah. Hmm. But um, yeah, we we argued quite a bit. I think on vaccines, I think on global warming, on, yeah, it's out there, yeah. Now, why do you think that each side needs a common enemy? You mentioned that on Chris Williamson, that it helps to unite people to say, this guy's bad, and we could all gear up together and say that person is uh, causing all of our problems. I just, I think when you are being attacked by somebody, it just brings people together. Uh, it's you have a common enemy you all feel like you've got a common struggle you've got a common purpose you can unite against something you have got something in common to hate uh i don't know why but for humans that's just a really unifying thing and what if there's no one to hate do they find somebody do they find something to or dislike about a person maybe turn on each other i'm not sure <laughs> i think people do generally need something like chris williamson says yeah. we keep bringing them up yeah, run gosh, away from gosh. something as well as running to something so it's like hating a certain group but also loving another certain group maybe yeah what is your favorite debate that you've participated in? So we actually use AI on every single episode of the Ice Coffee Hour, and it might actually be the most important new computer technology out there. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested, so buckle up. The problem, though, is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how are you able to compete without costs spiraling out of control? Thanks to our sponsor, Oracle, it's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI for short. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI offers four to eight Eight times the bandwidth of other competing clouds offers one consistent price rather than variable regional pricing. And of course, nobody does it better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and at less than half the cost of other clouds. Take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash iced. That's oracle.com slash iced. And again, to reiterate, it's free. So you can get started today, oracle.com slash iced with the link down below in the description. Thank you so much. And now let's get back to the episode. What is your favorite debate that you've participated in? Oof, my favorite debate that I participated in. Um, I really like things where if I do a lot of research and I acquire a lot of knowledge, it's fun. Mm. So Ukraine-Russia debates against, I think, I think probably the most in-depth one I might have had was against Nick Fuentes. Mm. I think that was a good debate because I did a lot of research for that. Um, I did a lot of research for like mRNA vaccines and, and COVID stuff. So those debates were pretty fun. I've done recently like a lot of Israel-Palestine research. Um, at the end of the month, I think pretty sure I'm having a two-on-two -two debate where one of my opponents is uh, Norman Finkelstein hmm. for another Israel-Palestine thing that Lex is going to set up. And I'm looking forward to that. I think Are that you going to be, be doing it with Ben? Because I saw Lex's tweet where he's like, all the people in Israel, all the people in Palestine. Hmm. I will be doing it with Ben, not Ben Shapiro. Ben oh. Morris. Okay, got it. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't think me and Ben are not going to be super aligned on on that in-depth of a conversation about Israel Palestine, I think. Broadly speaking, we're gonna be on the same side if you're like a pro-Palestinian person, mm -hmm. but I have very, very, very harsh criticisms of Israel. They're just not gonna come up unless you're really in the weeds on stuff. Yeah. Who do you feel like is the most influential person on the left and the right? Oh man. I feel like it's so like bubbled off. Like it depends on what part of the internet you're on. Like you could argue that I'm pretty influential in terms of like political left debating people, but depending on where you go, people have never heard of me or even like Hassan or anybody. So I don't know, broadly speaking, who is the most influential on the left. I feel like we just don't have much really big alternative media on the left right now. It's really not. Like on the right, you, I would say Ben Shapiro is probably the largest and most influential. Or Tucker. Mm. Tucker definitely wasn't even just on Fox News. I feel like he's lost a lot of influence after. I don't know on, on Twitter or on X now. The amount of views he's getting seems to be substantial. I and mean, we could argue even, is that even less on YouTube, than Fox. He, but... He's doing pretty good views right now. What does he do? Do you know like what his last video was? Yeah, look it up. They're usually in the millions. Uh, not usually. They they vary Depends on the quite cast. heavily. I guess on the left, the Young Turks. But that's not even like if you look at their views. Yeah. I mean, um, Tucker Carlson, one day ago, 260, one day, 415, two days, 440. Okay, days, so on Fox, he's getting Here's more. a million. Tucker's a definitely million. popular, but I like. I would say six months ago, Tucker was the most popular, mm -hmm. maybe media person in the world. Definitely the most popular He was the most consumed. Yeah, they had the most yeah. live concurrent viewers on Fox News. Fox, mm -hmm. I think, at five with Tucker. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he was the most popular in the world. So he's still big. I'm not saying he's like nobody now, but I'm saying he had he took a dramatic fall off a cliff when he got kicked off of Fox. And you had to be careful with the Twitter views because I think you realize, um, right, it's like if you watch a video for six seconds, yeah. it comes yes. to the view and it's not an accurate way of determining right. how popular a person is. Yeah. So why don't you feel like the left has more representation like the right does? Um... 
Man, I don't know. The center left is like just not a fun place to be. Nobody really likes you. You have to fight. Conservatives will hate you just as much whether you're center left or a communist. Mm -hmm. And if you're center left, everybody online is going to hate you because the only people online are the far left. And those guys are fucking insane. So They're why like, is nobody big on the far left? <clears throat> why don't we have larger the far left people are losers? There. They're crazy. And it's a super minority opinion. These guys are the most detached. They're all like millionaire socialist tanky fucks who like cheer when like Israeli babies are killed. Like they're actually fucking insane. They're unhinged. So, so when, where is the majority on the left? Uh, like in the real world it's probably mm -hmm. like center left but like center those left. people aren't online like you don't find like black people between the ages of like 45 and 65 like aren't on twitter or like center left you know uh like cosmopolitan liberals and shit aren't really on like twitter anymore so why are it's like young white affluent very very far left in college kids these are the people that dominate social media i think these days so what's the difference between that and people on the far right like why are those people on the internet I'm trying to figure out like what the commonalities are. People on the far, are, like, light, far right, I feel like, aren't super on the internet. At least now. Sometimes. Yeah, but it's, why, but it's, why do they, the personalities that garner so many views? It's different and it's weird, but like I would say, <clears throat> I would say that like for the far left, I think this is a very, very, very small minority of all Democrats, like less than less than like three or four percent, if that. It's very, very, very small minority. But on the right. I would argue that, like, for radical right, people like get really mad at me. I think yeah. that any, anybody that supports Donald Trump, I think, is fucking crazy. And that's like 85% of Republicans right now. So they're way more visible. You see a lot more of them. But because a lot of them are literally ready to follow Trump off a cliff, yeah, uh, yeah they, they just are, are louder on the internet. Yeah. So there is no, yeah. like, I guess I'm complaining about being a center left Democrat. Truly, being a center right Republican is probably a more difficult place to inhabit, I would yeah. imagine. I would say it's it's difficult for us, too, because we like to really have equal representation on the podcast, and mm -hmm. it's difficult for us to find people on the left to have on because there aren't that many. Mm -hmm. And the people that we do ask, it's very difficult to get them to say yes. They've denied us a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then some people, like, we ended up getting them on, but it took months mm -hmm. of scheduling, whereas the people on the right, they're kind of just like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Why is that? Do you have any idea? I think right now, I think when the left is kind of more in charge of like overall the media and they don't feel the pressure to be platformed because they are platformed, mm -hmm. they probably don't want to jump on to controversial or debate platforms as much because there's more to lose mm -hmm. and their own audiences will attack them quite a bit for it. Like, oh, you're supporting them. Why are you there? They platform this guy or why are you in this show? You know, Myron from Fresh and Fit was just there. Like these guys are white nationalists. These guys are red mm -hmm. pill or blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's harder because people on the left will hardcore audit you for uh, going on places that they don't approve or talking to people that they don't like. One thing that I've always found it really hard to grapple with is you think that if anybody supports Donald Trump, they're pretty much insane. Yeah. But that is still a significantly large population of a developed country of yeah. the United States. That's pretty crazy. So how do you <laughs> not have this like shadow of a doubt, at least in your opinion of like, okay, if so many people and within this group of people, there are extremely intelligent people, they're very thoughtful people, they're very charitable people, they're very like open-minded people. Find me some and I'll show okay. on this well, podcast you know where you talk to them. I don't believe that there are very, but, there are very intelligent people that support Donald Trump, but they do it with their head in the sand. Or if somebody were to say something like, listen, okay, yeah. Donald Trump is all these things, but I like the tax cuts are good. And I like the economy a little bit more because he like tries to deregulate something. Like, okay, fine. I'll, but, you know. but here's the thing. Yeah. South Park did a great episode where you have like a turd sandwich and like a piece of diarrhea. I don't know. And you have to choose between the turd sandwich and the diarrhea. If you have Trump and someone else, I'm just I'm just giving an example here, mm -hmm. and you don't like the someone else, doesn't that then by default you're going with Trump? Does that make yeah, you insane? Yeah, but that's only if you're dumb enough to think that your choices are two things that are essentially the same. Like I said, I understand why yeah. some people support Trump. I like when I say that they're crazy, I don't necessarily mean like in a malevolent kind of way, uh, or I'm sorry, a malicious kind of way. Yeah. I, usually they just don't know anything. So they I, like I Trump think, because he like yeah. owns the left. Or like, cause anytime, cause people say this thing like, oh, well, the both parties are the exact same thing. Like, no, they're not. Like, yeah. you're rich if you think that. You're, you're wealthy and you're stupid and you're disconnected. If you actually think that both parties stand for the same thing, they clearly don't, right? Abortion uh, or Supreme Court justice picks are a really big example of that. Their support for like same sex marriages are a big example of that. The difference in the types of legislations that both people have passed is a huge example of that. Mm -hmm. The different approaches to foreign policy are a huge example of that. Like, these, the two parties are very, very, very different in terms of what they stand for and represent. The only way you can think they're the same is if you just don't follow it much or if you're pretty wealthy and insulated and you don't really care that much and you just like whoever's the funniest on Twitter. Yeah, it's it seems as though a lot of people will look if it if it comes between Trump and Biden, people that like Biden and like the policies, but worry that his age is getting in the way and say, well, between the two of them, I don't you know, I, I might pick Trump. Just because the alternative 
is something that I think might be slightly worse. Yeah, I, yeah, I just, I like I said, find me one of those people and we can hash it out. It's just so not even close to true. Okay. <laughs> there's not, I know, but there's, 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 there's such a, a large contingent of people that feel yeah, that but they just don't know Trump. what they're talking about. Huh. I just, I just can't bring them in front of me. Give me I, ten of them. You could send me with ten in a room every single time I talk to these people. It's always the exact same thing. Like, why do you like Trump over Biden? Well, Trump did way better with the economy. What did Trump do for the economy? Uh. Tax cuts. How did that help you? Do you even do your own taxes? You make like $24,000 a year. You save me more money than you, you fucking retard. I actually save more money on my tax than you grossed in income because of your president who's a billionaire from New York and this is the guy that represents you. Like, none of it actually makes sense. I'm sorry. No, that's I'm just fine. saying, listen, yeah. when I talk to the people, it's always the same fucking talking points over and over again. They have no fucking idea about anything they're talking about. They like Trump because he's funny, because he represents a real anger that people have towards the system and they want to break shit. And Trump is the guy saying, I'll break it for you. And that's it. That's that's the extent of the support for Trump. There, it doesn't go deeper than that ever. There's no policy analysis ever. There's no foreign policy analysis ever. There, There's no like what did Trump actually try to do to get reelected? Nobody even knows about like any of the J6 stuff or the elector fraudulent scheme or the pressure on the DOJ saying he was going to fire one of them. and They didn't write fake letters to uh, state assemblies like nobody knows any of these things they just like trump because he's funny and he seems but like that relatable. means he's playing a better social game so at what point does that need to be acknowledged that he is somehow appealing to people's innate uh feelings of you know wanting to join him yeah i mean I, well there's two things well one is it might end him in federal prison so i mean depending because yep. he maybe played the game a little bit too much or two um People need to do a better job on the left of representing their ideas. And it can't be, you know, average age, 72-year-old white guy that goes on TV to talk to people. Yeah. They have to do a better job you know, of getting their I hate to say it, up. like, I'm not a fan of Newsom, but he does a good job on the left. Absolutely. Holy he Jesus, I saw him do a couple. Yeah. yeah like, Damn. Yeah. He is amazing. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if he runs for president and he becomes the president because he has amazing people skills, mm -hmm. incredible debate skills. He is confident. He is sharp. You know, again, it's like I'm not I'm not a fan based on what I've seen in California, but sure. this guy has something really special that I think will appeal to those people. Yeah. And I don't think anybody's going to make the mistake again, not in 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 uh, in the soon to be future of trying to run a candidate. that's not like people tested because, oh, my God. I saw this. You can find my stream. And I joke. I joke when I said it. I didn't have like a strong opinion at the time. But I remember the very first time I saw DeSantis walk into like a store and talk to me. I was like, this guy's never going to be president. There's no shot. He is so awkward. So, you know, uh, uh, mumbly with his feet and like any time. And he was just, this is not it. And yeah, I think as time has gone on, I think it hasn't been it. <laughs> and, and DeSantis yeah. is like a non. Well, I right, know he suspended his campaign. Right. right. So, I mean, like, but yeah. how do you see DeSantis and come to that conclusion? But at the same time, you have Joe Biden. I feel like he can't even like walk off a stage without five handlers helping him. It's not a matter of walk off the stage. It's a matter of like, do you have like, I don't know how to explain this, like presidential the energy. Bravado? Presidential energy. Biden has it. He talks. He's been a senator for a long time. The way that he talks and can talk to a crowd and smile at people and talk to people. I don't know why, but like uh, DeSantis just has this energy of like guy. Insecurity? I don't know what it is. It's just the way that he carries himself and, and speaks. He just comes off as like very hmm. wimpy kind of. Yeah. Wimpy. Yeah. It doesn't really have to do with how senile or not senile you are. Like some people just kind of come off that way. I'm not sure why. It's like a vibe thing, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Like in conclusion, the way that I see it is whenever I find myself in some sort of belief or having a belief system and then there's this massive opposition, mm -hmm. I usually try to eke somewhere closer to the middle because I know that I'm probably wearing like an ideological onesie as well as the other side. Mm -hmm. And there's still massive populations on both sides and both sides have people within that population that are super intelligent, super deep thinkers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I agree. So, I think it's always a red flag if you find yourself standing against a huge opposition um, especially in a developed nation like the United States where like yeah. there's, you know, democratized but I mean, yeah. information. And so, like I mean, that. one of the ways to test that, if you're really scared as well, go and talk to people, talk to a lot of them. Uh, I feel like I can represent their arguments really well, better than most of them can do it. Uh, if you, again, you can find me 10 of them, put me in a room with them and we'll, yeah, we'll have the arguments. I've done it over and over and over again. And on the facts, it just, yeah, fails time and time again. Do you recommend people listen to political commentators that lean right? You should always be receptive to opposing viewpoints. I don't like almost any alternative media. I just, I don't know. I think most of it's trash. <laughs> but, so you wouldn't recommend it? I, so I don't. don't listen to anybody on the right? Or left either. Like, I, I, most alternative media is just trash. But you're on the left. Yeah, I'm a special boy. Listen to me. So you're the YouTube. exception. YouTube.com. You're the one exception. I am. See, I the feel one like that's exception. another example of you mm -hmm. being this fringe exception where there's this massive population of other people on the left and on the right or even in the center. What can I say? And none of it's I'm okay. I'm a cool guy, yeah. you know? Um, here are things that I like about myself. And if other people did them, I would say, watch them. There might be people that do this. Okay. They, they might be out there and I'm just not aware of them, okay? Um, one, 
I don't have a rigid adherence to a certain political ideology. I have my political ideology, which I could be biased towards sometimes. I admit that. I'm not a fucking perfect person. But like, there are going to be things that the, the Democrats or progressives do that I think are fucking stupid. And I'm going to side more with, I don't even say I'm siding with Republicans, but I just have strong inclinations towards this way. Um, and the reason why is because I have a personal set of beliefs. And when a new situation is presented towards me, you're going to get my take on things. When you turn on my stream, and I think everybody now who is familiar with me knows this, if you're turning on my stream, you're getting what does Stephen Bonnell think about this particular issue. If I turn on, say, like Hassan's stream, I'm getting like, well, what do progressives or far left people think about this issue? Or if I turn on, uh, you know, like Stephen Crowder's YouTube channel, I'm getting what do like these kind of like right MAGA people think about this. But it's not really like a unique consideration of the facts and then a uh, filtering through their own personal, you know, like moral or philosophical lens. And then how do they think about things at the end of the day? Uh, I would say that's evidenced by the fact that I have like a variety of opinions that I get in trouble with on the left and the right. Um, so for instance, like I think that Rittenhouse is totally in the right. I think that um, there's good criticism of like a lot of the trans youth stuff. Um, that doesn't mean I'm fully against it. Um, like I can be, yeah, there, there's a lot of things I like that I can, Israel Palestine's also a little bit kind of, Oh, like true. I am a massive, big dick for Zionism. Okay. Mm -hmm. Totally fucking 100%. Yeah. Although I would be critical of Israel on a lot of things as well, but like, yeah, definitely come out in support of that. Um, but then like I fall very far left on some things. Mm -hmm. Um, However, I would say it can be deceptive, though, when people say they're on the center because they've got left and right beliefs, because some people will say that. But in reality, when you go to analyze their beliefs, they're actually just like anti-disestablishment or, dis or, or, or establishment. So, like, I would say that people like um, uh, Tim Pool, a friendly guy. But when somebody like that says, like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not on the left or the right or I'm even like center left or I'm more like a centrist. When you look at their beliefs, actually, there is anything that has to do with the establishment. So anything related to pharmaceutical companies, big business, government, they're against all of that. Um, although they be in favor of like every other, like whatever stands in opposition to that. Um, yeah. So I, I guess like find people that you feel like have unique or interesting points of view that don't always have to be like politically aligned. They don't feel a pressure to be politically aligned with one thing all the time. I personally... Maybe it's unreasonable because I'm a streamer, so I have like a different thing than what I would expect YouTube to do. But I stream like all of my research and reading. Like you can see what I read, you can see what I'm researching, you can see me putting together my opinions as I'm like I take notes, I publish the notes that I take on everything, and I show you what I'm you know looking up. Uh, I think that helps too, so you can see how I arrive at my particular belief, which helps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's I understand what you're saying in terms of like it's hard to think that you're like anytime you think you're, you're unique in a certain way. Statistics would prove you should otherwise. be. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, one I, thing I, I that's do... a, that is a good heuristic. What you're saying, like if I was listening to me say this and I was across the table, I'd probably think like, okay, well, you're probably full of shit and you just don't realize it, but you think you're unique for this particular way, which I understand. Um, but yeah, I mean, I stream all my stuff. I've made it to this point in my career. If you want to test it on anything, like mm -hmm. I said, I'll argue with anybody on the facts, on the morals, and the whatever. And I feel like I can make a good argument for what I do. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I just, I just don't like it when I have super high conviction on something that's just obviously controversial. Kind of reminds me of the thing that your mother told you: don't be so open minded, your brain falls out. Mm -hmm. In a sense, it's like I just don't allow myself to have super high conviction on certain things like that. But it could be a double edged sword. Uh, I, one thing I do appreciate is a lot of people. I feel like similar to what you'd probably argue for Ben Shapiro is now people have this expectation of he needs to have this ideology. So he's financially incentivized to have this ideology. Um, so, you know, he can interpret data in like, you know, what you would probably claim as an objectively incorrect way. But one thing that you've done, and I think you talked about this last time we had you on, was you have taken stances you knew would piss off your audience um, just because you found it right. Mm -hmm. So financially punished for seeking truth. Yeah. I would say that I, one thing that I wonder, because I'm, I'm trying to, um, when I'm trying to think of I'm being fair, try to put myself in the other person's position. Um, I wonder if I would feel differently if I had a company of people that were all relying on my political point. opinion. Yeah. So like if Ben Shapiro really, if that study for socialism did come out, Ben Shapiro's like, you know what? I am a socialist now. Um, say that negatively impacts, I don't know how many employees are the Daily Wire. Say like 40, 50, 60 full-time employees that are negatively I impacted. Like in the hundreds. Yeah, Is it hundreds now for full-time W-2 full-time employees? So. Probably. Okay, yeah. So if it was in like the hundreds of employees, maybe would you feel differently about that? But I, but actually, I don't think I would. I think I would just tell people when I hire you, like, this is what you're signing up for. Good luck. <laughs> I, I just, changed my opinion I on just, a moment's notice. I like yeah. to think that they would else. still be able to survive as a profitable company, even if they changed their complete narrative. That's sure. what I like to think. Yeah. Sure. Uh, That's another thing, too, is that like after you... I mean, when you made so much money after a point, it's like, I'm not like, oh God, like I'm only going to make 80,000 this month. So I'm 150,000. Like, I don't know if I could handle this hit. Like, I'm like, my lifestyle is the exact same. I mean, you see the clothes I wear, I drive my $40,000 Focus RS. I've got a nice apartment that I pay like 5,000 a month for. But like, other than that, I don't need like a ton of money for anything. So yeah. Do you think the American dream is dead? No, of course not. 
if you're poor in America today, you have no dependence, no disability, no cognitive or physical, and you're between the ages of 20 and 60, is it your fault if you're poor? Fault is a really loaded word. Like, I mean, the, the answer is always yes and no at the same time. Like, there's probably steps that you can take to do better, but there's probably reasons why you've taken the steps that you've had taken. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a hard, I, I, that's such a reductionist. Like, if you find, like, a person who's 20 years old and obese, is that their fault? I mean, like, kind of. They're choosing to eat the food that they eat. But, like, what if this person was obese at, like, eight years old? It's like 1% of people ever well, make probably it. probably a cognitive disability at that point. Or they just had kind of parents that, like, set them up for failure. <laughs> so if it's, like, morbidly obese, then it could be a physical disability, which we disincluded in this. So it's like... No, no, I'm not saying morbidly obese. I'm just saying, like, obesity... I like obesity as a lens for this because it's very... Like, that's a very clear, like, just eat less and exercise more. Mm -hmm. Eat healthier, exercise more. Those are things that every single person has theoretically 100% control over. But even though we have control over that 100%, it, uh, clearly it's influenced from our childhood right mm -hmm. like if you take a behavior and you say like oh every single person can make a choice on this every single day it's like okay well that's one you agree with that right that every single person can every day make a choice to eat mm -hmm. or exercise right right basically Correct. assuming no disabilities right right but if that was really true then you would expect to see a uh, smattering uh, it would basically be random for what everybody's weight and physical health would be in terms of um obesity right but it's not random chances are if your parents are obese you're probably obese chances are if you were obese as a child you're probably obese as an adult chances are if your parents and still these habits, you know, you probably carry these habits with you through uh, adolescence into adulthood. So a lot of stuff that's like your fault is kind of your fault, but it's also because of the way you were raised. So it's just good to have a realistic perspective on there are certain behaviors that you might have that came from childhood and it is your, it's within your power to change them, but like they came from somewhere. So you have to like work to accept that and then change it at the same time, if that makes sense. It does make sense. So you were okay. saying that there are some exceptions um, once we bar out the certain things that I had mentioned that we barred out, uh, the cognitive and physical disabilities and mm -hmm. no dependence and stuff like that, that there still will be exceptions. Um, of those exceptions, whose fault do you think it is then that they're poor? Instead of looking at it as, as fault, you should just look at it as every single person has 100% responsibility for themselves. I agree okay? with that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. regardless of who's at fault, it is your responsibility to, and only your responsibility to improve yourself as much as you can. Now, there might have been things in your childhood that put you on a bad path or that fucked you up. And, you know, whose fault it is, is, you know, is debatable or arguable, but it's your responsibility to change it. Now, the, the only time I would say that fault is important in determining how uh, this is a uh, we we can go over specific examples. We can talk about this for a long mm -hmm. time, but sometimes uh, ascribing blame or fault is important because if you're really, really, really far off the norm, sometimes it can be the problem is you have to be careful. It can either be really empowering to, to ascribe fault or blame or it could be really disempowering to ascribe fault or blame. You just have to go through that process in a very careful way. I don't think you should be ignorant of fault yeah. because I still think that is important. Like you just alluded to like two minutes ago that you need to see it through a real transparent lens. Yeah. Like you need to be experiencing reality for what it is, mm -hmm. but I don't think that you should put a bunch of weight in fault. I think you should probably be aware that there might be some culpability from somebody somewhere, but it is ultimately yeah, the, well, the productive thing is whose responsibility is it? It's mine. Yeah. A lot of people want to figure out the root cause of something. And if, if in that case of, if they're obese, here's why. I'm obese. Here's what I was taught as a kid. And because of that, I am where I am today. And because I understand this, I could better, you know, uh, fix this going forward. Okay. Only in those circumstances, I think is it good. But people have a really hard time doing that. Uh, or it feels like it. So here, this is what I like to hear if somebody says this, okay? Let's say somebody yeah. says, uh, oh, I have XYZ condition, okay? Therefore, I do this thing. I think that's really positive and really good. But often what I'll hear is, oh, well, I do this thing because I have this condition. Um, these sound the same, but like, say somebody says, I have, um, oh, fuck. OCD. Sure. Well, say, I'm, I'm, I'll make some shit up about it. Sure. Let's say somebody says, I have OCD. I can't handle pink things or blue things. Okay. Therefore, in my house, I've gotten rid of every pink and blue thing. So it doesn't mess with me ever. Right. That's cool. But instead, I usually hear the reverse where somebody will be out and they'll be going crazy and they'll be hitting everything. And it was like, oh my God, what's going on? I'm like, oh, well, I have OCD. That's why I do all this. And it's like, okay. Instead of using like the, when they do like this fault analysis, instead of using it as like a, a, a like a diagnosis that they can then try to fix their life with, instead they learn this thing and now it's like, oh, thank God I've got this new crutch that I can just throw out whenever I act improperly or whenever I like fuck my life up. Mm. And I'd rather see people, if you analyze the thing and you understand it, use that understanding to build off of it and then either remediate it or, you know, 
find a way to avoid whatever triggers you or find a way to fix or cure whatever is going on rather than now that I've identified this, oh, now I never have to. Oh, I've got, you know, X, Y, Z condition. That's why I'm like such a piece of shit all the time. Ha ha ha. And then like, that's it. Yeah. I agree. I think you should frame your belief system in such a way that makes you better off at the end of the day. And what you're alluding to right here is better off insofar as you're using it to explain something and you're using it in a productive way to like actually make a measurable positive impact on your life, such as removing those things from your house. Yeah. Rather than saying that you're a victim and then just having inaction and continuing to suffer. Yeah. So what uh, what uh, advice would you give to those people who maybe have something that they feel is holding them back? They could place blame. They could place fault on something. How do you overcome that? I mean, like, uh, it, it's, I, I think I feel like I need to talk to the person. It, it's just, yeah. it's so, it's so individual. Um, the, the, here's like two different things that I see. Okay. Sometimes there are people that take no responsibility for themselves and then they'll identify a thing. And then when they, they identify that thing, like, oh, this is why um, I'm such a piece of shit. This is why I'm so lazy. And then anytime anybody comes and tries to say like, hey, like, don't you think you should do this? I'm like, oh, I can't. I've got this thing. And it's like, okay, well, shouldn't you do something about that? I'm like, no. It's like, okay. So if you, if you find that you use your past as like an excuse to never do anything, um, or you, you have some condition or thing and you're using it as an excuse to never do anything. Uh, I mean, you're just kind of like a piece of shit. Like, that. I mean, it, you're, yeah, your life is going to be worse off for it. It's not helping you. It's not, you're, nobody else is giving you credit for this. Like, nobody ever thinks like, oh, you know, there's this guy and I used to think he was like a really lazy piece of shit. But then I found out he had this condition. So now I like totally, like nobody thinks yeah. that. That's stupid. Um, but on the other end of it, sometimes too, you've got people who are, they, they try to push forward too much and they won't actually stop and think like, hey, listen, you have a thing that you really need to address and you really need to understand this thing and do something about this because it's holding you back and just pretending that it's not there and pretending it's not having a negative effect on you is actually hurting you because you won't come to terms with it first. So yeah, there th- those are like the opposite ends of that spectrum and both people need to move in totally opposite directions. But also sometimes I think people, these two people will switch themselves a lot too, mm. um, which it, it just, it, that's why I'm saying like it's very individualized. Um, for a long time, I had, uh, I think it was like seven years ago, my son got diagnosed with ADHD and got on medication for it and everything. And my community has always memed about me having it and blah, blah, blah. And I think I was the person at the one end of the spectrum where it's like, listen, okay, my brain works. I can sit and I concentrate, blah, blah, blah. I'm just kind of like a lazy piece of shit. I can do this, okay? Um, and my God, it took me, I think it was like four or five months ago, I had a friend who suggested like, hey, like I have Adderall, you should try some. I was like, oh, fuck it. For the first time in my life, I was like, holy shit, okay. Maybe I actually have ADHD. I'm going to go fucking get a prescription and we'll see blah, blah, blah. And the past four months of my life have been unbelievably different my entire earlier life. I cannot fucking believe it. We could go on this Adderall conversation for hours. I had a very similar experience, suffered. I figured I had ADHD my entire life. It's been in my family. It was in my family too. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, because when my son got down, it's a very high heritability. And then I started looking back. It's like, oh man, maybe this is why my parents are late to every fucking thing we've ever been. So late to everything. Oh my God. Also, I remember one very distinct memory. I was taking piano lessons and Mm -hmm. my teacher, rather than fixing your notes, fixing your posture, fixing fixing all these things to improve your piano playing, he said the number one lesson in all caps, underline, 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 focus. Yeah. I just never throughout my entire life. How do you know if you have ADHD? Okay, so with uh, most mental illness or most neurodevelopmental things, uh, there's all, everybody has some degree of everything. Uh, I don't know if you're like on the border. I don't know what to tell you or I don't know how to help you figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, you should go to a professional. You can get an assessment. They do a lot of like big neurocognitive testing if you're looking to like really know. Uh, or you can just go to a psychiatrist or therapist and get like a, a less formal assessment where they do like a questionnaire. Uh, in my opinion, for me, Growing up through childhood, there were a lot of very, very, very obvious examples. So, like when it came to standardized testing and stuff, like uh, I think we did the ITBS, I think it was IO test of basic skills. Um, my scores were always very, very, very high, like 98th, 99th percentile on all of these tests. My ACT scores were very good. I think I got a 35. And um, my in class work, my GPA was like 2.7. And that was like in all AP classes. So this was curved up a lot. Uh, and my GPA was horrible. I could not focus to do homework to save my fucking life. Okay. I remember I would get math times. I, I would cry because I don't want to sit and do it. Um, and not because it was hard. It was the idea of like sitting and doing anything ever was just fucking agonizing. It was horrible. Um, and there were, I was the only kid in my entire grade whose parents had to sign my assignment notebook and the teacher had to sign it to make sure everybody knew what my homework was. Otherwise, I just wouldn't do anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say that I was like exceptionally outside of the norm in a lot of different ways in terms of uh, my ability to focus on things versus, you know, what 
theoretically should have been like my intellectual capacity to do things. Um, yeah. So medication for that is just basically made it so that like, oh, like um, I can actually sit and read something for four to yeah. six hours but and not hate my life. To yeah. me, that just seems mm -hmm. like you, you weren't challenged in school. Like if you're scoring really high, but you don't want to sit there and do the homework, to me, that's like you're, you just seem bored. I wouldn't think well, that's Well, there are ADHD. other indicators too, like hyperactivity is another one. So for example- Can like, be. Well, with ADHD, it, it's the like random like twitching that you always have. Like if you look at someone's hands and they're always like moving their hands or they're bouncing their knees and stuff like that, that's mm -hmm. the hyperactivity. People conflate that with hyperactivity, such as somebody who like runs around everywhere, like a like golden retriever type personality. Yeah, it's actually all of these mini mm -hmm. like little twitches that people have in order to like the reason keep their... the reason why I hesitate on the hyperactivity thing. It it can come out that way, especially with the twitching and the fidgeting. Is ADHD at the end of the day is a disease of focus, and it's how do you direct your attention um, for some people when they can't direct their attention they become hyperactive because they just want to like run around especially boys like to run mm -hmm. around and do physical things or whatever but at the end of the day it's like can you sit and focus on something that you don't ordinarily have the ability to because people with adhd have a really hard time relating to uh like reward that's not instantaneous um because there's actually like parts of the brain that are neurodevelopmentally delayed like if you autopsy like an adhd person there are certain parts in the forward part of the brain that are like and it's anywhere from like 10 to 13 percent smaller than an ordinary person and what that means is for uh for a neurodevelopmentally healthy brain if you've got to read something for four hours you can sit down and you can do it and you can read it because you know that you have to for somebody with adhd it is like an excruciatingly challenging task because unless you're being like constantly rewarded with some stream of stuff to sit and actually focus on doing anything is like impossible that's lack which is, of dopamine yeah and the the paradoxical kind of understanding of this or the way that it's kind of weird is that a lot of people say fuck i hate these things i kill people that say shit like this people say things like oh adhd is a superpower and so my like, bullshit is not a fucking superpower that's so stupid but see people look at people with adhd and they'll talk about something called like hyper focus all hyper focus is is because adhd brands usually so starved for dopamine if you find something that rewards you regularly you will sit there and be fucking glued to it because now you have something that's like making you feel like okay for the first time because your brain doesn't ordinarily produce dopamine at the levels it should. That's why a lot of people with ADHD will sit and play. Like for a long time with my kid or for me, I was like, I'm a professional StarCraft 2 player. I play StarCraft 2 for 16 hours a day. How the fuck can I have ADHD? Well, it's because this is like a game and it's rewarding me every single 10 seconds. I'm getting like another fucking hit and it feels good, you know? So what does Adderall do exactly? Um, the, so what an amphetamine is supposed to do is there's two ways that you can basically hit these little neurons, uh, neurotransmitters in your brain. Um, I think one is to prevent dopamine from coming out and one is to like push it and vacuum it back in. I think what amphetamines do is they prevent the reuptake of dopamine. So it increases the amount of dopamine availability in your brain. Um, methylphenidate. So that would be like Ritalin or concert, Concerta. Concerta. Um, these things like prevent the stuff from like going out. They basically work the problem from two different ends. But at the end of the day, the goal is just make it so you've got higher levels of dopamine and no epinephrine available in your brain, which like makes you a little bit calmer, a little bit more able to focus on things that ordinarily you wouldn't be able to focus on because you want to go and do something else. And what yeah. was that like for you though? What did it feel like? Like the first time trying it? And then you realize, wait a second, maybe I do have ADHD. For the well, for I'll be totally honest. For the first three days, I was fucking amphetamine high. Okay, I like amphetamines. I think they're fun. I think I've done dextroamphetamine recreationally on accident in the past. What is that? I thought it was, uh, we'll just say methamphetamine, basically. Oh, um, I thought I was getting <laughs> okay. MDMA. I was in Amsterdam, but um, it was a fun time. It was really nice. I was just high for like twenty hours. I don't know why. Um, and then I didn't like MDMA in the past. So there's like I think there's a euphoria associated with amphetamine. So the first three days, I was trying this Adderall, uh, Adderall XR. I was definitely just high. I could definitely feel high. I was like, what I was the dosage? Uh, I started well because my friend was on twenty milligrams of Adderall XR, which is probably high to start with. Uh, but yeah, for the first three days, I was like fucking high. I was like, this is cool, but like I know I'm just high. After day three and four, when the euphoria wore off, what I noticed was that like I could be on my computer, and I could just read stuff. And I was like interested. I didn't have to keep rereading the same fucking sentence over and over again. And I could just sit and read and absorb the information and understand it. Talk about it for hours and hours and hours without having to feel like I was being like sucked to my other screen that I had to like have a, oh, like, so for instance, like if you guys are watching in my stream, I'm always like playing games and stuff. I haven't played a video game, I think in like four months because I just don't have the drive where it's like, I need like something that's like making me feel good all the time. I can just sit and read and focus on stuff, which is so fucking nice. Yeah. This is going to, uh, you're going to hate this, Graham, uh -oh. but right. this is the first time I've ever said this to you. I recognized recently, so I review every podcast before yeah. it goes out. We have editors, and then I kind of do the final comb over. Uh -huh. Recently, what I've been doing, because I it takes me hours to go through a two-hour podcast at 2x speed, because mm -hmm. I just pause it, rewatch, do this and that. I just can't focus. But if I play a video game while I'm reviewing it, I can get through it so much faster. 
similar sure. to exactly what you do when you're researching, doing this super, super high level, deep research at the same time of playing a video game. For some I reason, used to, just... I used to, but now I don't anymore. I don't need to now that I'm like medicated for the past four months. I don't need to have that video game in the background. Yeah. So, so I, I have Adderall prescribed, but I mm -hmm. take it very sparingly. Oh, like, shit. Like I have a sporadic schedule because I, I talked to my psychiatrist and he was like, you know, ideally you don't use it every single day, which is always how I was caught up on it. I thought that once you're prescribed, you take it as a every single day to, to supplement you basically. But actually what it is is to make up like if you get a really bad night of sleep and the next day you need to perform mm -hmm. for some job or something like that you take it to bring to bring you back up effectively oh, that's but crazy. you should I completely disagree on every single part so, of that so, so I, okay yeah, th this ahead. is something that we should probably talk about out outside sure, of the podcast because yeah, yeah. I think it's we're getting pretty mm -hmm. nuanced here on Adderall that's okay. but this is something I mean I since I was like 19 I've like had it mm -hmm. I quit cold turkey for three years mm -hmm. not taking it at all realized my life was like way worse when I wasn't taking it period mm -hmm. now I'm kind of like using it sparingly but okay. that's another conversation that works for you yeah yeah fuck I wish okay, I could yeah. remember you had a uh, Derek I think on from more yes. plays more days and yes. he was sanctioned more. I was getting super fucking triggered but I think it's just really hard to tell like who actually has problems versus who's just like kind of lazy I think that's the yeah. way the but way I look at it is how long have you had this issue have you had it but, whole life no why does it seem so much more common now you see this these these things it's like ADHD is going up through the roof and it's over prescribed do you think it's because we're testing for this now and we could acknowledge what it is or do you think that people are misdiagnosed all the time I mean it's probably um it's probably over prescribed and under prescribed at the same time I think it probably just depends on the person I think it's it's like 4 or 5% of people have an ADHD diagnosis I, people think today that it's like 50 to 60% it's not that high like people think it's way higher than it actually is um but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm uncomfortable. No, Dr. K, Dr. K yeah. answered this but question. It, uh -oh. Did he? Yes, he said that a lot of say? people, and the same thing goes for actually autism these days, but a lot of it is actually just autism by proxy, and the same thing is ADHD by proxy. Because if you look at the way that we're actually spending our time, it's just scrolling on TikTok or yeah. scrolling on Instagram Reels and stuff like that, and that lowers our uh, dopamine. To I like would fight super... to the death on this as well. There's and, absolutely and, no research that... that connects ADHD to environmental factors, like scrolling on screens or anything like that. Oh, this, is, this, is, this is what Dr. K said. Yeah. Here's the thing. Anecdotally, I think there's definitely a correlation between TikTok scrolling and attention span. It increases people's like standard for like entertainment value threshold at any given moment because mm -hmm. they're so used to super high entertainment value. And then it decreases the like basically everything else yeah. and makes it monotonous. Like what would you say to like a three year old kid or like a two year old who's who's getting used to just like swiping, swiping, swiping and just scrolling? It's like it's, it can me, it's I'm like saying there's no research that connects any amount probably of like it's electronic. So new. But there's like, how, how many? You, the how thing do you, is there so many distractions these days and i think that's what because people aren't productive because you have advertisements commercials mm -hmm. instagram all of these yeah things and there might be those wanna... distractions but those just, but it doesn't change the the actual composition of your brain your right ability which is to create... adhd by so, proxy because sure. people find themselves unproductive since they're constantly being distracted by all these different things sure but although and i the research on this is scarce because i think it's hard to do this but, but there's one study that i was familiar with where if you give amphetamines to people what they did was they i think they broke people into three or four groups um if you give amphetamines to people who don't have ADHD and then you assi assign them work, uh, people you give amphetamines to will do more work, but they're not more productive. The, the quality of the work actually mm -hmm. suffers. And the funny thing between this particular uh, study was, it, it, I think it broke into four groups, the people that did the best when they were given the placebo, meaning um, no amphetamines, and then you did their work. And then when you gave them amphetamines, they their performance was degraded. They became the worst performers afterwards, even though they didn't feel that way. They actually felt like they were performing even better, um, probably because they were high on amphetamines and it feels good. But when you track their, the quality of the work, it decreased. So the idea that like if you just give amphetamines to everybody, everybody will like become better, I don't think is actually empirically tested anywhere, as much mm -hmm. as it feels very counterintuitive. And I'm not a proponent of that, idea, just to- Sure, okay. It yeah. seems like what you would need to do is take two kids uh, two twins, mm -hmm. put one of them on TikTok and one of them on a book, and then test attention spans after like five years and see who or has a higher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, it just, even for myself, I find myself falling into the trap at mm -hmm. 33. If I scroll TikTok or Instagram Reels for too long, for too many days in a row, I find myself, it's harder to focus that following week after. Like, there's a cool down period where I yeah, have to. Yeah, like, I definitely, I understand you know? what you're yeah. saying. I, and I don't necessarily disagree. This is just, I just have to yeah. put this out there for my, for my fellow strugglers, okay? Because it took me until I was 34 years old to finally get medication to do this because I would fall into the trap of saying, like, I'm probably just lazy. I play too many video games. I do this and blah, 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 blah. But one thing that happens growing up, and I don't know if, if you felt this way, is 
Graham, you know what time of year it is. Tax season's coming up, so you know we have a lot on our plate. And if you run a solo small business, you know about all of the different headaches that come with running your own company, including things like taxes, payroll, and documentation. But with our sponsor, Collective, you can focus on growing your business while you leave all of the taxes and bookkeeping to the experts. Collective is the all-in-one financial solution for self-employed entrepreneurs that lets you focus on your passion by handling all the back-office work you dread, like accounting, bookkeeping, payroll, and taxes. They even specialize in setting up best which is a tax election that saves its members an average of $10,000 a year. If you're a business of one making at least $60,000 in profit annually, then you could be missing out on thousands of dollars of tax savings each and every year. And for a limited time, Collective is waiving the onboarding fee when you go to collective.com slash ICH and tell them ICH sent you. That's a $199 value for free when you go to collective.com slash ICH and tell them ICH sent you. For the last time, that's collective.com slash ICH and tell them ICH sent you. Thank Thank you so much, Collective, and back to the episode. I would fall into the trap of saying, like, I'm probably just lazy. I play too many video games. I do this and blah, 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 blah. But one thing that happens growing up, and I don't know if if you felt this way, is when you complain about a certain thing, everybody will kind of agree, but they don't actually do that particular thing. It's like a virtue signal. So I would say that when I was in high school, easily, I think I probably studied for 10 hours hours cumulatively through the entire four years I was in high school. That might be an overshot. I could never sit down and study. But when you talk to other kids like, oh, like, did you study for the test or blah, blah, blah. People are like, oh, no, like I couldn't, blah, blah, blah. When a normal kid says they're like, oh, no, I don't think I could really study. What they mean is they studied for like an hour Friday, two hours Saturday, and like only an hour Sunday. That's what they meant when they would say that. Because we would get tests back and I'd be like, oh, I got like a 73 on my calc fucking paper and the kid next to me who didn't study and couldn't bring himself got like a 94 and mm. i'm like fuck how'd you do this again it's like oh man i think the last thing on sunday like it, it just helped and i was like what do you mean the last how many fucking days you study for this for right so there are definitely people that are just lazy or that complain or just want like a drug to fix things i understand that but there i think there are a group of people that have adhd hopefully who their your brain is just it's really 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 hard to stay focused on things holy shit and the problem is that if we are to believe the current state of adhd research and if we are to believe that the researchers know what they're talking about if you have that type of brain you cannot ever 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 self-motivate it is impossible you don't have the neurochemical composition or the developmental structures that are grown enough to do it the only way to do it is to externalize all of the rewards so like a counterintuitive example for a kid that has adhd you might think that like okay well i know he's got adhd i'm going to be more patient with him so that he can do you know his work in a timely manner that's the opposite of what you're supposed to do you have to actually ride that kid harder you have to be like hey do this do this do this do this because when you constantly remind them that's the only way that they actually get it done because they can't internalize the like okay i know this sucks but like it'll just take three hours and i'll be done with it and that'll be fine it is impossible for a person with adhd at a certain level to be able to do that ever yeah so, okay i'm done with my spiel fuck i'm sorry that's great. I, I want to keep talking about yeah, that. We'll talk more about it okay, afterwards because this gotcha. is, yeah, that'd be a great conversation. I also, I've last five seconds. The only other reason I bring that last thing too is because amphetamines are a really, 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 really awesome mind drug. And that like when you take people with depression and you give them like SSRIs, bro, that's a whole fucking like one month period of like titrating up in doses and you don't even know it's going to fucking work and you might have fucking kill yourself and blah, blah, blah. Whereas if you have ADHD and you get like an amphetamine, you'll know the next day or three days, like if it's good or bad, there's not this ramp up and ramp down and like, oh, I just got off my ADHD med, so I'm going to be like for a month like yeah that's my last show okay if you have adhd go get tested sorry i'm done <laughs> all right real quick yeah ben shapiro no, just sorry. to, to <laughs> right, so chris to, williamson to yeah. describe some definitions what is the difference between a leftist a liberal and a progressive a liberal broadly speaking the worldwide definition of like liberal is just somebody that believes in like uh like the bill of rights so you think that you should have like some freedom of speech freedom of religion uh private property rights you're probably a capitalist in the united states more specifically uh a liberal is a democrat but like on the rest of the world they would say like well conservatives and liberals in the united states are liberals broadly speaking because we all believe like in liberalism um so those are kind of like the two different definitions of liberal okay uh, liberalism though yeah is in, in top level like just a definition well, like when somebody says liberal, they usually just mean like democratic capitalist person, mm -hmm. broadly speaking, like worldwide. That's what a liberal is. In the United States, liberal just means Democrat. Does that make sense? Yes. And you okay. said that that means someone who usually supports like the Bill of Rights. And yeah, it would just be like type. Yeah, broadly speaking. Yeah. OK. Yeah. And then making amendments too, though, to the to the Constitution. I'm sorry. When like I say that, Bill of because... Rights, I just mean like stuff like in the bill, like you should be able to go to court and the government shouldn't like infringe on your property and like should protect your freedom of speech that's what i mean like broadly speaking that's like mm. a liberal so how is that opposed to a conservative um in the united states it's not 
like I said, like if you go to Europe, they would say like, oh, in the U.S., like conservatives and Democrats are both liberals. They're mm-hmm. liberals. They believe like in democracy. They believe in capitalism. Mm-hmm. They're both liberals. Yeah. And then a leftist is usually in the United States. People will say anybody that's a Democrat is a leftist sometimes. But uh, broadly speaking, like around the world or sometimes in the U.S., a leftist is a socialist or a communist, somebody that is not a capitalist. And then what about a progressive? Progressive is they can be a uh, they can be a liberal or they could be a leftist, meaning they might be capitalist or anti-capitalist, but a progressive is somebody that that's usually more social policy aligned where they mm-hmm. feel very, very, very strongly about um, like anti-racism. Uh, it might be like trans LGBT stuff. Um, a lot of stuff relating to like white supremacy and stuff like that. So is that top left then? What do you mean top left? Like on a political compass. Oh, I don't think about that political compass, but maybe. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. But if somebody says they're progressive, they're really telling you about their social views generally. And then there's going to be a big overlap between between progressivism and leftism. Mm -hmm. So a lot of progressives might also be like anti-capitalist, not necessarily. But you could also have liberals. Like I would say like I'm a liberal and I'm pretty progressive because I'm a very big supporter of capitalism and democracy. But I also am like a big supporter in a lot of like progressive social ideas. So, yeah. Why are liberals more unhappy? Um, I don't know. That's a really hard one. You don't know? I don't know. How happy are you? One to ten. I'm super happy. I'm like a nine point five. Why do you feel so happy? Um, I don't know. My I'm a uh, that my whole life story is kind of unique, so I don't know how much it applies to everybody else. But I mean, I I get to I just I have a really high mental baseline. Like, it's like even if I'm grumpy, if I go to sleep, if I wake up, I'm usually like pretty even again. Uh, I just do stuff in my life that I enjoy doing, and as long as I feel like I can continue to do what I enjoy doing, and I feel like I'm making incremental improvements on myself, I just always feel like I'm in a do good you, place. Do you feel like happiness might be genetic? that you have a high baseline, maybe your parents had a high baseline or someone in your family did and you inherited that because some people have a very low baseline, I've noticed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's possible. It's probably, it's going to be some combination of environmental and genetic factors. The environmental factors might be really early in life, like before you're like six or seven years old, but who's to say, yeah. Have you ever gone through a period of time in your life where you felt depressed? Like depressed in response to something? Yeah, there've definitely been like a few days where I was like, ooh, this thing sucked a lot. But I'm very much like, uh, for whatever reason, stress is like very empowering to me. So when stressful things happen, I usually feel like I've got the tools to deal with it. I just want to like keep pushing forward. Um, The only time I've ever had like stuff relating to like, like mental, like neurological depression or whatever. Uh, when I was 30, I did a lot of mushrooms. And the, for that year, I had a lot of strange mental issues, but I think it was probably like a, um, probably a reverberation from that initial mushroom trip. But other than that, no. What were some of those issues that you had? Like- um, for the first time in my life, I had bouts of anxiety. So mm-hmm. like sitting on a couch and for no reason, my heart is just like fucking thumping in my chest and I don't know why. And I just feel very anxious. Um, a few days of hardcore uh, anhedonia. So like, I feel like nothing can make me happy. I don't even want to get out of bed. I don't want to do anything to make me happy. I just feel kind of like worthless, uh, like really weird stuff. Like I say weird, but unfortunately yeah. I live with things like this. But yeah, I think yeah. it's just because, I, yeah. It was, you think because of those, what was it, mushrooms? Yeah, I did a really big mushroom trip. And I think I had a response to that that took me about 12 months to get over. How it. much did you take on that trip? Um, uh, it, was, it was 10.5 grams of dried mushrooms. It was a fucking stupid amount. 10.5 grams. Yes. What made you think that was a good idea? <laughs> or did you not? You just wanted it. To- so prior to um, prior to doing mushrooms, I did edibles up to I think like tw- I think I could do like a twenty five gram cookie. And for me, is that weed edible? Weed edible, yeah. Okay. Um, I think it's grams, not milligrams that they measure it, right? Do you do we? I don't know. Okay, yeah. So Recful had a friend who got us mushrooms, and they were all like neatly baggy in like three point five grams each, so that we could have our you know our trip, and. <clears throat> I remember I was debating between two and 3.5 grams because he was saying if you do two, you can have like a, you'll see like the walls breathe and it'll be like a kind of a cool experience. But if you do 3.5, you'll have like a full mushroom trip and you'll have like the whole, the different phases and blah, blah, blah. And so I'm going to do 3.5. So I took a whole bag and then I ate it and I was like, okay, cool. And I just remember feeling after 30 minutes, I was like, oh my God, I know what's going to happen. I already know what's going to happen. Nothing is going to fucking happen because all of this is stupid bullshit. It's literally fucking mushrooms. And everybody on stream is going to say like, oh, it's because you didn't try enough and blah, 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 blah. And I remember somebody saying that five grams was like a heroic dose. And I'm like, fuck it. I'll just eat two more bags. So I ate seven more grams because it's fucking mushrooms or whatever. Who cares? And about an hour in, I remember seeing like colors on the wall for the first time on the because i think when you get high on psychedelics at least for me for lsd and mushrooms you kind of see like colors like kind of moving and the wall breathing i thought oh shit i'm finally like getting high this is actually really cool 
And then like 10 minutes later, it was like, um, yeah, probably the most intense extreme experience of my entire fucking life. I think I was like totally out for like 30 minutes. Like, what do you, you mean know, totally out? Like, I, like the, when I, like, I'm in terms of seeing in my eyes, I'm just like moving through like basically black and then fractal colors of like tunnels of light and shit. And I'm just completely and totally disconnected. Uh, the perception that I don't exist anymore, that I don't even know who I am, that the person that used to knew who I was was somebody that was like distant a long time ago. Just like the whole, it was a whole process of being stuck in other dimensions for, was it s- yeah. scary? Yeah. I, I think there was the guy next to me and every time I would come out of it, I'd be like, don't let me die. Please don't let me die. I think I'm dying. Please don't let me die. <laughs> yeah, it was really bad. How long were you high for? Just six hours. I think mushrooms are pretty reliably like up and down six hours, even if you do a lot. How <laughs> grateful were you when you stopped being high? I, it was the best experience of my life because I, I felt like I survived like the most traumatic thing ever. And I was just happy to be alive when I came back. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever feel like since that incident, you get little bouts of feeling like, oh my God, like I, like flashbacks to when you were high? Because I feel like I hear a lot of people, they say they take acid, they take mushrooms or something like that, mm-hmm. or big doses especially. And for the next few years, they could go through like, just like a little scare. Like they, they feel exactly what they felt in that high moment for just a split second and get really scared. Only when I'm getting high on other stuff. So mm-hmm. something I realized a month or two later, I tried to do edibles again and I was right back in my like the peak of like my mushroom trip. And I was like, oh shit. So now if I smoke weed, I have to be like in an emotionally good place because it's going to be a very, very, very psychedelic, like shifted experience. I'm going to be going to another dimension every time I smoke weed now, for instance. Yeah. Did you learn anything from this? I learned a couple of things. One is I gave a lot of credit to kind of like your cognitive mind to sort through reality. I figured that you've got like 10% is like your mood. 90% is like your cognitive, you know, human brain thinking i like have switched that now where i think like probably 90 percent is like this underlying stuff you don't really have access to and 10 percent is the stuff you're thinking about mm. um yeah mm. reals i don't like to be alone i like other people that's freaky <laughs> well, it was very freaky yeah <laughs> back to your expertise yeah i want to talk really quickly about the cultural and political shift that i feel like is happening right now okay joe rogan elon musk and other people of influence appear to be moving to the right you see elon replying to end wokeness on twitter a popular conservative publication elon recently collaborated for an hour with ben shapiro more people appear to be aligning more with conservatives. How many people do you see are moving to the left these days versus the right? I mean, it's more visible and people moving to the right. But then the question is like, how left were these people ever? I don't feel like people are necessarily moving to the right. I feel like we're doing a rehash of, you remember like 10 years ago when people would be like anti-SJW? Mm-hmm. They're not like really conservative. They just don't like all of the crazy SJW stuff. The very hardcore progressive stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah, back then we just called it SJWs. But yeah, now today, now it's like called woke or progressive. And I feel like you're just seeing like a similar thing. Like people that are really woke are like the old SJWs. Sometimes you just push things too far and be like, eh, I don't think I feel this. And then they kind of like go in the other direction. But like these people aren't really conservatives. They're not going to stay there for a long time. Like Elon Musk is not like religious. He doesn't like vibe well with, um, you know, like hardcore fundamentalist religious people or uh, evangelical Christians in the United States. And yeah, I don't think it'll last much, but we'll see. There was a, uh, it was like a chart or a graph or a spectrum thing that Elon tweeted where it was like people on the right, people on the left, and then Elon right here. So he was like more so aligned on the left side of it. And then it was like, that was back in the day. And then now it showed the left had just pushed so far left while the center and right have stayed exactly the same. And now he's like on the right side of the spectrum, even mm-hmm. though he still feels like he's on the left. Yeah, that chart is fucking stupid. Accurate to no, that? Elon is just a fucking moron. You he shouldn't ever be like to. to that. No, it's fucking dumb. Every, all the political positions have changed. The right has changed dramatically. If you were a Bush era conservative, the idea that your political party is now anti-corporation, hates all big business, and is following a New York City billionaire off the edge of the earth who has like had three wives and was fucking porn stars and paying them off with campaign money while cheating on his wife. This is the new, you know, like moral leader of your political party who also makes fun of okay. like war heroes and, and like makes fun of like POWs and shit like that's wild. That sounds like you're like saying that, that ba- basically all conservatives are saying that Donald Trump is their moral hero. When in actuality, I think that very few people, honestly, on the conservative side, believe that. I don't believe that. And I think, I think it's the biggest cope in the world. Okay, but what do you say to the people that that say I'm really going to vote for Donald Trump, not because I support him, just because I hate Biden? They're and lying. I feel like it's the exact they're same lying. thing on the other side. You think they're always lying. You think they're all, it's always all of them. The I run into lying. so many people. They'll do this thing where like, yeah, I don't really support Biden, um, and you know. 
Trump isn't the greatest, uh, but I, you know, I'll vote for Trump. I guess. And then every time you look at social media, it's always like, uh, Joe Biden sucks his son's fucking cock while he's fucking smoking <laughs> crack cocaine. <laughs> Donald Trump fucking owns this fucking guy. Like, uh, embarrassing Hunter Biden release sex tape. Uh, Donald Trump fucking own like every dude. I can I listen just to think, an hour of this. Yeah, no, dude, have it's every so single cool. fucking time I talk to these people, I have uh, never found uh, the moderate Trump supporter. It is always people that like when I talk to them, they are blue in the face because I know they just came from throating like an eight inch like trump realistic replica dildo because that's all they you probably you probably never met them because they are the people that are never going to talk about it's it. the same people i yeah. feel like that are liberals or on the left that are not super extreme that you feel like most people are right there i feel like that same thing exists on the right where it's just you don't really feel like like compelled to integrate yourself into this whole thing because it's just so toxic and, and violent. And yeah, but the difference like is, is when you look on the left, like if I go to the center left and I'm like, what do you guys think about like progressives or what do you guys think about, you know, like lefties or tankies or whatever? A lot of them will be like, I don't really know. But that shows I can find that sentiment. If I look in Congress, there's what, like four maybe progressives. If you talk about like the justice Dems, right? If I look at Republicans, they couldn't have their they, they had no house major, uh, majority leader for like a month for the first time in all of u.s history because they're playing so many stupid fucking games in the house of representatives if i look at the republican party you got the largest conservative figure in all of media tucker carlson going on tv talking about how cool trump is and then the leaked text messages that came out over the dominion case were like i hate this fucking guy like he's destroying our network he makes you know america look fucking horrible i can't wait till he's gone we don't have to suck off the studio anymore i'm paraphrasing a bit yeah. um but yeah the it's not the same it's not the same. They're, the people, people have gone too far left. Like I have friends. I don't know if you guys are like this because um, you seem like you don't have friends. I'm just kidding. Mm -hmm. I have friends that live like in Seattle and Portland and they regularly tell me things where it's like the people here are fucking cringe. I like it's gotten way crazier than what I'm used to. And I know a lot of friends like that. I don't know any conservative who's like, yeah, like all these people around me are huge, like MAGA, like Trump supporters that I'm so uncomfortable. I've never heard that in my life. Now, maybe I have a different set of friends, so it's not like that, but I think that you can see in the polling data, you can see in the politicians that are supported, you can see in the general bend of both parties. On the left, Biden doesn't ever, now maybe if you're conservative, you're brain dead, you think this, but on the left, recently, Biden is not trying to cater to woke tards ever. Like the biggest time that he tried to cater to them maybe was through the student loan debt cancellation stuff. Well, what about mm -hmm. all of the, the invitations to like the transgender people, to the White House and that one lady who like exposed, I think like as some naked part of her body. I'm sorry, I, I could be getting the gender wrong here, but like that person got naked at the White House. I feel like that still is kind of pandering towards that. It might like pander. Sure. Okay. I'll qualify. Maybe they like pander a bit, but like And then the that's White it. House video there for, for Christmas. That one too. I feel like most so of that one pandering a little bit more oh, towards. Yeah, they might pander, but like at the end of the day, if you look at Biden's legislative agenda, if you look at the lawmakers that are mm -hmm. in Congress, it matches the composition of the Democratic Party, which is largely not that. But if you compare that to the Republican side, the like the Democratic Party right now is in a totally good spot. The Republican Party is on the verge of collapse. Like we can pretend that both sides are the same, but if Donald Trump doesn't win this next election, nobody has any fucking idea what the Republican Party is going to look like because Donald Trump is the Republican Party. He is the center of the party right now. 80, 85 percent of people would follow him if he were to run third party. The Republican Party has lost its total center in terms of leadership. The only person there is Donald Trump. And yeah, I, I just think to pretend that both are like, yeah, you know, they both have their things. It's, it's just not at all the same. What do you think, think about Vivek Ramaswamy? I don't. You don't. You don't think of him. Don't think about this guy. He's a fucking Why? loser. I don't know. What do you mean? He was a good litmus test for. Oh shit! Wait, did you guys like Vivek? I was about to say really mean stuff. No, no, I mean, no, I, I'm a different, yeah. I, <clears throat> I don't have like a hard stance no, on the thing. Neither we we had him do. on the podcast. Yeah. yeah. He, was, he was really kind to us, really he generous with his time. And also, um, I like a lot of like his, his uh, that you, they could just be PR moves, mm -hmm. but he seems very diplomatic and supportive and understanding of certain things. Like when Trump was restricted from the ballot, he said, oh, I'm going to do the exact same. It seems like he's doing it from an ethical oh. standpoint, maybe politically posturing. You could make that argument. But it's it posturing. Like was... I don't even know if he knows why Trump has taken off the ballot. I don't think anybody does. I want to know about Jeffrey Epstein. What about him? What a disappointment. <laughs> My God. You, you have all of the answers, right? To Jeffrey <laughs> Epstein. Does. Here's what happened. Here's what people wanted there to be. People think that there are a bunch of politicians and billionaires that are raping kids all day long, and they love that theory. It's just such a fun, awesome theory. Hillary Clinton was involved in it. Bill Clinton was involved in it. All the, Prince Andrew, all the billionaires, they're all involved. Okay, and then when a story like this comes out, yes, you finally, okay, QAnon, the pizza shop, everything is coming together, okay? This is it. The child, billionaire, politician, sex rape ring, finally. 
And I think what probably actually happened was you had a billionaire guy like Epstein, who was a pervert, who paid off a ton of girls, not even the majority of them, a minority of them were underage, to come over, give him massages, maybe give his friends massages, and sometimes jerk him off. But the vast majority of it was probably legal. The majority of it probably weren't minors. There were a few that were, I think, two confirmed, I think, only two. Um, and he just, like, sometimes he would, like, send girls to go and, like, rub and tug his fucking friends or whatever. And that's it. Do you think that any of it could have been for blackmail? No. Absolutely not. Or, I won't say absolutely not, but right now there is zero evidence whatsoever of that at all. And the idea of doing something like that for blackmail in U.S. territory against some of the most powerful people in the fucking world, that sounds like the most scary thing you could ever do. Why would you, why would you want to, I'm going to blackmail ex-president, I'm going to blackmail every rich and powerful person, like... But I think there's a narrative that he has videotapes or he has photos. And there is a narrative. And could say, hey, mm-hmm. if you don't do this little thing here... We got these photos and we could release it. The guy's it already a billionaire. There's no evidence of any of this ever being the case. Nobody has asserted this or claimed this. It is pure, fantastic, like, everything. Like, there was just no reason at all to believe that to be the case. It's a fun story and it's cool and it's sensational. There's no evidence for any of it. And if you really think about it, mm. it would be pretty wacky for a guy like, oh, I'm going to go and blackmail literally all of the most powerful people in the world and see what happens. Why would you ever do that? That sounds like the dumbest thing ever, no? But maybe that's why he's dead. But then why isn't Ghislaine Maxwell dead? Why wasn't he killed before he even got taken to prison? What, like, there's like a billion other ways that this could have played out more reasonably. Like, that kind of guy wouldn't get arrested. He would get fucking whacked. He would get assassinated. There'd be like, who saw Kill Bill? You guys didn't see Kill Bill? Long time ago. Not a big movie guy. (laughs) Remember the Asian girl who killed the one guy in the bed because, and she was like a a long time ago. The audience would not remember. remember But they all hate Someone will remember that. They all love the Epstein story. It is is bad. Listen, a lot of you hearing this for the first time, okay? Epstein probably didn't do anything that crazy. He probably paid off some minors to jerk him off, which is bad and wrong and coercive and gross and disgusting. Majority of the girls weren't uh, weren't underage. I don't think anybody got like trafficked in the sense that they were like abducted or kidnapped or forced to stay somewhere where they didn't want to. Um, I don't think he was sending children around to all of his friends so that they could all be in some pedophile sex ring. Um, I don't think that there was any like blackmail, crazy shit, anything like that going on. There's literally no proof or evidence for almost any of those claims, but they're fun. Are you concerned at all about politicians trying to put the political opposition in jail on both sides? I'm on the Republican side, not on the Democrat side. (laughs) What do you mean? When I look at the history behavior of Republicans trying to jail or talk about jailing political opponents, I think it's very worrisome. I would say that so far, I think Democrats have been fairly responsible when it comes to how they approach it with some select criticisms for the way that they conduct themselves. But I think all of the Trump indictments are 100 percent fair. All of them are public. You can read them. Some of them he he's dead to rights on like the Mar-a-Lago thing. Absolutely dead to rights on that. Um, the New York thing is like, uh, kind of I don't know. Um, the Rico thing in Georgia and the main Jack Smith case for the uh, insurrection stuff, I think is really strong. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out in court. But yeah. But you compare that to like the Jim Jordan, like house impeachment inquiry of Biden because he because he saw too many Hunter Biden cockpicks or whatever is like fucking stupid, I think. And th- that's the the documents you're talking about? Mar-a-Lago is the classified that's, that's the information. Classified information. Correct. But didn't yeah. Joe Biden have classified information as well? Yes. And so the, the status on that. So... Again, this comes down to a fact of the matter thing that I think a lot of people just aren't aware of. Uh, Taking classified material Mm -hmm. out of a, uh, they're called SCIFs. I'm trying to remember what it stood for. It's like secured classified information area, designated area or something. Taking classified material is not a crime. You might get fired for it. Taking classified material is not a crime. The crime, if you actually read the criminal statutes um, under the U.S. Code, and you can see them on all the Trump indictments, the crime is if you knowingly take something or if you keep something that you know you're not supposed to have in an unsecured area, that's the crime. So for what Joe Biden did, and I think Pence did this as well, was either, I think it was their lawyers discovered like, oh, here's a document <clears throat> that might be classified because a lot of it is retroactively classified. It's not classified at the time you take it. And then if you communicate with either NARA or the FBI or the DOJ, and you're like, hey, we've got a classified material here. Do you want to come and take this or whatever? Then they do that. You're, you're fine. That's totally it's happened to a ton of people. It happens every time presidents leave office. Sometimes they take a bunch of stuff. Some stuff gets retroactively classified. NARA will come and they'll take this stuff. That's all fine. Donald Trump had the ability to do that. NARA reached out to him in um, March 2021, I think. Um, and then it wasn't until a year later that the FBI finally came knocking on the door because he wasn't cooperating. He wasn't turning any of it back in. And when you read all the leaked stuff, he knew that he had stuff that he wasn't supposed to have. He was intentionally trying to move the boxes around and hide it. And he was telling his employee, that Nauta guy, or Nauta, 
Nada, I think, he was telling him to lie to his legal counsel about where stuff was and what was where and to move it around to hide it from them. So Donald Trump was knowingly, he was satisfying the mens rea aspect of that criminal statute to be committing the crime of having uh, classified material and retaining it what against- What was the material? What was in it? Um, national defense secrets is part of it. So for some stuff it related to, um, if you if you actually read the indictment for the Mar-a-Lago case, they list, but it's all in like vague terms. So it'll be like a document might be the weapons capability of an ally when it comes to this type of attack, um, the defensive capability of an enemy in this region. Like those are what they're all marked as. It won't tell you specifically what it is, but. And why would he keep that? Good question. <laughs> Why would he? I don't know. He showed off some of it. There were at least two instances that they are asserted in the indictments where he's just showing off, like, I think one is Iranian attack plans, where he's talking to a um, reporter and he's like, look, uh, Millie, he tried to say that I wanted to do this, but look at what he did. He's the one that made this plan and he was showing it to a reporter. So that's one instance of it. And then there was another one talking about plans or something to another person. Yeah. Those are crimes. Okay. The obstruction element is also a crime. Um, yeah, retention, willful retention of national defense secrets is a crime, even if the materials, um, even if it was like declassified. Um, the and then the obstruction of justice charges are crimes as well. Um, the falsification of federal documents was one of the indictments. Uh, conspiracy for obstruction was another charge. Yeah, yeah. At any point, do you think it's in the people's best interest to limit free speech? Yeah, of course. And where do you draw that line? Uh, I don't know. It's a hard one to, to draw, but like obviously. There's tons of limits that we all agree. I can't make plans with you, for instance, to go and kill somebody, right? And then go buy something to do it, right? That's conspiracy to commit murder. Conspiracies to commit crimes are arguably, it's just a speech element and then one step taken towards the crime that's not illegal. Um, the obvious like shouting fire in a movie theater is illegal. Um, you know, leaking uh, classified information can be a crime. Like, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of free speech things that are crimes. Um, yeah, I don't know. It super depends. Um there's the Brandenburg v. Ohio standard for inciting a riot. Like you've got to know, you've got to have the intention of inciting a riot and know that your words will cause a riot or whatever. And there's got to be like imminent lawful or lawlessness that you're mm -hmm. encouraging people to do, et cetera. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, that's very broad. It depends and on, you need a specific example of, yeah. How would you limit where to platform somebody or where they fall on that, that you even want to give them a platform to talk? Probably from anybody. I think, I think, well, if it's popular enough, I think you should always be talking about it, right? If there's like a guy who thinks he's got like a rock solid argument for why we should sacrifice children to the sun god, and he's got like 0.0001% popularity, I probably wouldn't platform this guy. Mm -hmm. But for Donald Trump or all of the stuff relating to conservatives there, these are all very, very, very popular beliefs. There's a large segment of the United States population that believes in these things. So the idea that you wouldn't platform that when, you know, 30, 40% of Americans believe it is insane to me. I agree. I'm not a huge fan of the word platforming or mm -hmm. platform, which I feel like it's kind of exploded in usage in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. How could you have this person on? You're just platforming these ideas and stuff like that, which I think is just like, I think that that thought, if you're thinking that, that's like plagued well, I, your Well, brain. I think the argument is that you're giving, you're exposing this person to a wide range of people who may never have seen this person. And because we're the ones to introduce that person to a new audience, they might take on those beliefs. But how do you know you're right and they're wrong if they have support from like, you know, a non- Well, to the person who disagrees, everything that person says is bad. Right, but I'm so saying it's, that it's up to them that having that thought. If you recognize that thought, <clears throat> then you should probably look inwards and question that thought. Yeah. I think it's also a matter of like how equipped is that person to deal with it versus you. Like if I, like if I, like if I was the world's most intelligent flat earther, I could probably beat you guys in a debate about flat earth, right? Yeah. You're, like I, I, I would yeah. say the same. Yeah. I don't think I would win a debate against the world's best flat earth. I don't know. The world's about best, probably not. Yeah. yeah. And that's probably true of almost every conspiracy. I think I know a lot about like Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, vaccines, but the like the top experts in any of these things could probably say almost anything to me and I don't know if I could counter it. Mm -hmm. So if I have very strong moral beliefs about how I think we should feel about, say, like vaccines, I'm not going to bring on like the world's best anti vaxxer because I'm probably going to get crushed in that argument unless I do a lot of very particular research for this particular debate. So I wouldn't want to like give this guy access to my whole audience where I can't counter a single thing he says. So I think that's fair sometimes i think it's just the way you say it and with the confidence if you say something with like a hundred percent conviction i almost can't disagree with it because i could just say well my experience is different but if you believe that to be true sh you know sure yeah. go for it but i don't agree and just leave it at that but i think a lot of people want that I'm and if you say it in a very fluent way yeah people say fluency is a proxy for accuracy which i kind of agree with Interesting. It depends on what you mean by fluency, but I, yeah, I probably agree with you. Like yeah. if you're able to just kind of like go and just yeah. maintain a good yeah, I would agree. Bah, 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 yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. The way that you talk. Mm -hmm. Do you think journalism is failing America? Mm, a little bit, but I also think America is failing journalism. 
I think that they're very reciprocal. Like they feed back into each other. And the type of journalism we have today is very much a response to the type of things that Americans want to see. And I think we all kind of have to do a little bit better in moving towards a more responsible future. So who's it up to first? Um, I would argue the journalists. It's up to the, so we should set higher standards for journalists. Well, when you say we should set higher standards for journalists, that makes it like the people need to move first because we're setting the standards, oh, you're right? right? You're right, you're right. Yeah. So you'd say it's the government needs to set higher standards for journalists. Um, no, journalists need to set higher standards for journalists, I think. But why would they do that when they're financially incentivized otherwise? I know, it's a hard one, right? So how do you But why would the people do it nut? when the people like watching people screaming at each know, other and being the most part the of That's the problem. That is the problem. So they feed back in. That's what I mean when I say feed back into each other. Because that financial incentive is the feedback mechanism. And then for consumers, it's the consumption mm-hmm. uh, lever that's their feedback mechanism. So they're going to watch the things that are entertaining them the most. And journalists are going to produce the things that entertain them the most. And then you're stuck in this horrible world. That's the tough yeah. part. It's like you don't want to restrict them, but you do want to somehow incentivize them to angle a little bit more towards truth no, rather than... It's human nature, though. That's why the news is so negative all the time is, is that's what that's what keeps people watching. Mm-hmm. And we've even realized it on my main channel of just like negative titles get twice to three times the viewership than a positive title mm-hmm. consistently. And it's one of those things where it's like, well, do you want to make a positive title that a third of the people watch? Or you make the same video, the same message with a negative headline, people watch it and take away the message. We were even talking about this earlier with um, a podcast title. Do we say the five things you could do to get rich or the five things you could do not to be poor? The poor title, like this, it's the same video, but the negative connotation does better. And so from a journalistic point of view, it's like the negative is going to get more attention. People are more likely to click it. There's no reason for them to change that. Yeah, I don't know. It's a tough one. I wonder sometimes, yeah, I don't know. I, this idea just popped in my head, so yeah. I might completely, two days from now, think it's the dumbest thing in the world. <laughs> but I wonder if people are drawn to the negative stuff because their actual real life is actually pretty decent, even though people don't realize it. So you're like drawn to the negative stuff because it stands out more. Like, do I want to turn on the TV and watch like some happy, normal, ordinary story if like my life is like kind of boring or whatever? Or do I want to see like some exceptionally crazy shit? Because I'm thinking like if you take people in like really exceptionally fucked circumstances, like would they be listening to negative stuff all the would. time? I Do you think, think they, they would? would? Because I, think, I feel like yeah. when I think of the people that have the most engagement with politics in a negative way where it's really driving them crazy, I'm usually thinking of like middle class kids who are like their life is fine. I'm like, why the fuck? If this stuff makes you so miserable, why are you fighting about this all the there time? Was, there was something but, I saw yeah. it, of like the fear of loss versus the pursuit of gain. And someone fears losing one dollar way more than they would pursue getting two dollars there's a lot of like the ratios are like yeah the ratios are so skewed towards like i'd rather not risk this little bit than have all of this upside yeah and my understanding is that all of that was really designed to keep us alive like we have to be on edge because what if a lion comes out and like kills you or you do that one thing like it's more worth it to try to stay alive than it is to try to you know, we had a psychiatrist yeah. on the podcast who also did crisis negotiation, mm-hmm. and he said the reason why we're so fearful of negative things happening is because it's been coded into our genetics, into our DNA. Whereas back in the day, like Graham said, if you weren't fully perceptive of all of the negative things like eating a certain bad fruit or like going into a certain bad part of the jungle where a lion could attack you, like that was the end of it. That was the end of your entire family tree, end of spreading your, your genetics, end of your entire life, end of everything. Mm-hmm. Um and we're so used to that, that like kind of scared mentality, the scarcity that has just kind of like stayed with us, even though we don't really have any of those like super violent threats. Yeah. It's still way more important when you're walking through a dark alleyway these days to think somebody's going to come and get you um, rather than to just be completely oblivious of negative things that could happen because that's the end of everything. Yeah, very little margin of error when it comes to your safety. Mm-hmm. Or yeah, your possible, life. Yeah. Yeah. So One thing I, yeah. that I absolutely despise about journalism is they can make certain claims about people. And then these claims, these alleged claims, they turn out to be false. Mm -hmm. And then they don't make content that would say, oh, sorry, guys, I made this like claim about this person. It kind of ruined their their life, but it turns out it's not false. And I'm sorry, I'll do better in the future. That just never happens. For example, this is a personal example, but it it happened to my favorite artist in the entire world. His name's Rex Orange County. So he had a bunch of articles made about him doing alleged sexual assault. Mm -hmm. Um. And then I was in all of his like fan groups and everything. And everyone was saying, I will never forgive him, even if he ends up being not guilty, because this is just such a disgusting thing. Right. So he is incurring actual financial damage, uh, reputation damage, measurable damages to his life because of all of these articles that came out. Turns out CCTV footage came out, proved him innocent, like actual irrefutable evidence. 
all the charges got dropped and nobody made any content whatsoever saying that he was innocent. Mm -hmm. And now I still feel to this day when I meet people and they ask me about my music taste and I say, oh, I love Rex Orange County. They always say, oh yeah, but what do you think about that thing? It's like they all know about the alleged infraction, but nobody knows about when he was actually absolved from it. Yeah, that's definitely a problem. Even, even if people did publish retractions, the retractions always get way less coverage than the original claims. There was something that I saw on uh, Twitter, and it was this huge follow-up of this, I think she was like a congresswoman or something, that said she was sexually assaulted in like uh, the train station. And she pointed to the guy, and they caught the guy, uh, and all these headlines went out about him. I was trying to just find his name. And then they pulled up the CCTV, uh, CCTV footage afterwards. And the guy just was on his phone, accidentally like, kind of bumped into her like this and kept walking. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And then no one really reported on it. But they later found out how ridiculous this was. And then they posted it calling out this Congress. It was, maybe she wasn't a Congress. And she probably didn't suffer that much. No, she didn't. How but, much this no, but, but this guy, I believe, like lost his job. He was targeted. People like were sending him death threats. They were trying to track him down. Like, the same all thing these... happened to Kyle Rittenhouse. Kyle Rittenhouse had several death threats. And like you said, assuming mm -hmm. your take on Kyle Rittenhouse case is correct, and he was doing completely fine thing, not in the wrong in any capacity, mm -hmm. but he suffered horribly yeah. because of this thing and hardly any media well at least on the left more so on the, uh, the mm -hmm. right does it um covers it yeah i mean that's bad of course i agree um a lot of the coverage of those stories are really bad the, one of the most fucked ones that i thought was funny was the um bird watcher the central park i think it was in central park the bird watcher guy mm -mm. who ran into the woman with the dog and she called 911 on him mm -mm. Oh, fuck. Never mind. No, Wait a second. I remember it. this. Yeah, it was, it was a, big. That guy has a TV show now, I think, on like the Discovery Channel. He, his whole life got made for that. And that woman's life got destroyed. But basically, I think there's a recording of, um, I don't want to get the quoting on this wrong, especially because we're talking about misreporting. But there's, yeah. a, there's like a video of him on his cell phone. And she's saying something like, uh, like, hi, 911, like, there's a guy here, uh, there's a black man here, and he's threatening me, and something like that. I don't remember she says something like, uh, like, oh, like, you're a black guy, like, the cops are going to get you. I don't know if it was something specifically like that, or if it was just her saying, like, there's a black man here, and he's like, oh, you're being racist, and blah, blah, blah. And he published that video uh, and online, and her life was destroyed, and obviously everybody said he was a hero who endured this horrible Karen white woman in the park, blah, blah, blah. But... When you go back and you look at the actual Facebook post that, that the black guy admitted on his Facebook, now I'm not trying to say that the woman was necessarily in the right for calling out the cops, but on the guy's own Facebook, he said that he had brought doggy treats because this woman was bringing her dog to the park and he thought that the dog needed to be on a leash or something. And he brought doggy treats and he was going to try to lure the dog away from her so that he could like take the dog or something. And in that light i'm like okay well i kind of oh. understand if he's threatening to do this because then he also threatened like i'm gonna get your dog and blah 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 that she would call mm. 9 now because she's worried or whatever it, it paints that story in a way different light yeah. but um yeah there's a lot of random stories where you get like half the i mean you brought up kyle rittenhouse all of Kyle Rittenhouse happened because of the riots that happened in Kenosha, which was in response to like that 14 second Twitter video clip of Jacob Blake. Do you remember that? Mm -mm. Black guy goes into a car with a cop behind him and he shoots him in the back like seven times and it looks horrible. And but the entirety of that was two or three cops were wrestling with this guy to try to not get him to go in the car that had like the two children of a woman that this guy had previously sexually assaulted. Uh, and the cops were trying to get him to not drive off with the kids in the car. So when the full story came out, in my opinion, the police officers were completely exonerated. Maybe you, they should have tried harder to take him down before him getting in the car or whatever. But initially, it looked like just some black dude trying to get in a car where the cops were bowling him and they shot him in the back for like seven times for no reason. Right? Did anything happen to the police officers? Um, I don't remember what the follow up for them was, but I know the Kenosha riots were in response to that video, mm -hmm. the Jacob Blake video. The problem with stuff like this is that you're financially incentivized to trigger negative emotions in people about a, a given enemy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it just lines your pockets more the worse you make them yep. seem. Cops, immigrants, black people, conservatives, liberals, yeah. For me, I don't like the fact that they could make all these alleged claims but almost state them as though they're a fact. Yep. Like there are some of these things where I read them and it's like, you know, this person took this person into the thing, beat them, and did this and this and this. And then at the end, it's like, allegedly, according mm -hmm. to the complaint or whatever it might be. And it just, it makes it sound like, oh, they're stating this as a fact and this is true. I feel like for media, they're generally, well, they'll always say allegedly if, that, if that's the case. But and then for we Twitter and stuff, no comment, you know. for Twitter and stuff, it'll be, I, like, I always tell people, like, 
if you see a 12 second video, you should always be wondering why it's a 12 second video. We mm-hmm. all have cell phones. We've got CCTV footage. Like if you're seeing 12 seconds of video footage, it's because somebody very specifically wants you to see only 12 seconds of video footage. That should say something to you. You know, sure. we had a conversation with David Packhouse. He was the guy from War Dogs. If you've ever seen that movie. Nope. And uh, there was a major media publication. I think it was the New York Times that made this massive article on him saying that he was delivering improper ammo to the Afghans, sourcing it through the U.S. military. And then all of these secondary publications source or they cite the original publication, the New York Times, basically as fact. Mm -hmm. So as it goes down the line, Mm -hmm. people just start citing other things and citing other things. And then it just eventually becomes fact. Yeah, that happens. Yeah. I notice sometimes when I try to track down like an original source or claim for something, I'm clicking and clicking and clicking. And what was like 15 different sources is actually only one. Mm -hmm. And then when you go to that one and you try to figure out where they got it from, you're like, hmm, yeah, that happens. I got a question about Tucker Carlson. Yeah. He was recently spotted in Russia. People are speculating he's going to be interviewing or having a conversation with Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Do you think more journalists should strive to have those hard conversations with people that are kind of warlords i think journalists should have hard conversations that's not what tucker carlson is going to go he's going to go do the constellation thing putin is awesome because he's standing up to the u.s that's weak and they're losers but putin is based and strong uh, and they believe like in christian values in the family and they don't believe like in weird trans gay shit and he's like you know doing what he needs to do to be a man and traditional and America is like weak and feminine. And it's just like that East versus West culture work. Stupid shit. That's exactly what that whole interview. I just spoiled the whole interview for your entire audience. So make sure you put a spoiler spoiler on this section because that's the entirety of that interview is going to be like that. I love the conviction that you have with that. And we'll be able to directly like actually. Good. Clip me. Yeah. It's that's exactly it what be, it's going it to be. It would be hard to go to Russia and criticize Putin to his yeah. face. I mean, that, what, I mean, you how gotta, far could you take it to begin with? Right. There's probably going to be like armed guards yeah. just outside of the whatever building they're in. Or yeah. Room. And, yeah, but and I probably just wouldn't do it then. If I have to either choose yes. to be like a mouthpiece of some guy or not talk to the guy, I probably just wouldn't talk to him then. I think it depends on what Tucker's incentives are. If his incentive is I want to make money and I want to expand my reach because mm-hmm. a lot of people are going to watch this, I'm just going to do it and say whatever I need to say. Sure. Mm-hmm. That's probably what he's, yeah, we'll try to do, yeah. I am having a really hard time understanding the left perspective as far as the border, to be honest. Um, Obviously, for everyone to get up to speed on the news, Texas started putting up walls. The federal government was trying to take them down. Civil war was trending in the United States on Twitter because people think that it's like actually the first time since a state is disobeying direct orders from the federal government for what, like 50, 60 years or something like that. It had been a very long time since something like that had occurred. Um... The Supreme Court ruled Texas can't install razor wire and barriers to mitigate legal immigration. Um, What are your thoughts on the governor, Greg Abbott, um, saying that they have a right to defend themselves? The federal government should not be involved in this. What do you think about the federal government removing the razor wire? Um, This is just a legal argument, uh, and it's not going to be satisfying for a lot of people, but the federal government has exclusive jurisdiction on matters relating to immigration. States have no jurisdiction whatsoever. Uh, If the federal government and their enforcement of border policy is doing something and Texas wants to do something with them, they can do that in coordination with each other, with the federal government's consent, Mm -hmm. Texas cannot defy the federal government on immigration law. So if they're putting up razor wire fence that ICE or whoever DHA, I don't know who, um, is it ICE? Immigration and Customs Enforcement? Are they the ones that are at the border? I feel like it's a different agency. Customs and Border Enforcement, CBE maybe? I don't know. I, fuck, I don't remember. It. I think it's, it might just be ICE. I don't think it's ICE. There's, an, there's another name for the agency. But um, yeah, if they're down there and they're saying, hey, stop putting up this razor wire. It's fucking with our job, you know, and then Texas continues to put it up for purposes of regulating immigration. Texas doesn't have the authority to do that as a state. Just full stop. They don't. Okay, so barring what the current rules are saying, what mm-hmm. do you think should happen here if you're going to make the biggest possible benefit for benefit for Americans? Uh, and do you think that that should be the main thing in the purview of I mean, the, the I mean, the federal government should have exclusive rights to do immigration. That's just that's the only way the country works. That nothing else makes sense there. Um, so, I mean, that should be the case in terms of like how to actually deal with the border. Um, it's always hard to tell, like if things are bad or not, because everybody has like an incentive in blowing up other stuff. Uh, like every year, you know, conservatives say there's a new refugee asylum seeking crisis on the border and it usually is like overhyped. But um, this one seems to be different. Well, because Abbott is like making it his like 
job to now defy the federal government in terms of how he wants to enforce border policy. Um, I, I think something definitely needs to be done. Obviously, there are issues relating to the border and people like coming into this country illegally. I think Biden is trying to pass legislation to get something done, but Republicans are also blocking it. I think Biden was asking for more power when people were saying that Biden already has the authority to solve the problem. That I don't think it was the... power. I think he was asking for money. I think they just need money. Our is it money? Our border system is like really backed up. Like, I don't think we have enough money for agents. I don't think we have enough money for to do the court stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just it's he needs more money for it. And that legislation is being held up in Congress right now. Um, what we really need, unfortunately, is like comprehensive immigration immigration reform. We need to figure out, we need to redo how we let people into this country. And there's just not the political will on either side for it yet. So is this not something that's concerning to you at all? There are parts of this that are concerning. The main part is the that a state governor would defy the federal government and then get support from like 25 other governors to do that. That's very scary. But but this isn't high up on your list of priorities as far as like what's happening right now policy wise. It's actually it would be one of the highest things. I just don't just talk about because, it because of the difference between the state and the federal government. Yeah, because it well, it makes me sound unhinged. But <laughs> yeah, mm. assuming all the facts and I haven't done like the super deep dive into this, like but if the facts are as like think they are or have they been have they been like presented or whatever i think Abbott should be arrested and thrown in federal prison because mm-hmm. he's literally like rebellious there are again this would be the same thing as if california were to say like oh well we've actually decided today that we're going to let anybody from mexico that wants to fly into the state we're going to let them fly and stay here even if they're legal immigrants they can just get out at the airport and they can go and live in this in this state if they want to which would be insane you can't do that do you have confidence that if the uh the plan that biden has proposed would be approved that it would actually drastically improve the border enforcement in this situation? I think it would improve it. Would it drastically improve it? Uh, I don't know. Biden's enforcement right now is, I think, a little bit better than Trump by the numbers. Uh, People don't like to hear that. But the reality is, one, Trump's final year in office was very easy because of COVID. There weren't very many people coming through. And because Trump could use, I think it was Title 42, um, he could declare a national health emergency and Mm -hmm. do hardcore border enforcement, which Biden couldn't do anymore. He tried to. And the Supreme Court said, you can't use this title anymore to do this because there's no more COVID health emergency. Um, But I think the Cato Institute did a big analysis on the number of people that were were coming in as a percentage of like border crossings and et cetera, et cetera. And it showed that Biden was doing percentage wise a bit better. There's just a whole bunch more people trying to come right now, especially once COVID is over. So I think that like more money would help. But again, we need like comprehensive like immigration overhaul. And I don't know when the fuck that's ever coming. Yeah. So my understanding of the situation, and let me just state this right here. I get most of my information from Twitter sure. on the left and on the right, just to be clear. Mm-hmm. Um, but it seems as though the, the remain in Mexico was just – it obviously went away with Title 42 and then people are coming. They're saying that I feel threatened by my current government. Mm-hmm. You get led into the United States with a certain court order that you have to appear by so-and-so date, say three or so months in the future. And then people just come into the United States, drop their passports, drop everything, drop all documentation, and then pray that some policy is going to be passed for them all to be granted granted amnesty. Yeah, I've read that. I don't know by the numbers, like how much it's actually happening. So uh, I, I have done current, the it might, that. Might, if that is happening in a huge amount, that would be a, a bad thing. But I don't know if that's happening more than it ever has been in the past, or if there's any reason to believe that it's happening more than it ever has been in the past. I think that the number, so I, I've seen a lot of data on this at least, but it could be skewed data, but it does appear that the number is like 10,000 illegal immigrants coming per day from the southern border that are going into the United States. <clears throat> and the thing that's concerning for a lot of people is if you added up all of the numbers, I think it was since the beginning of Biden's presidency, the do, uh, the known number is 6 million. And then you have all of the unknown gotaways, which are the people that just get through the border without actually being you know, on a camera or anything. And 6 million people, I think I saw some number where it's a greater population than like some some crazy amount of the actual population of certain states like yeah i mean i think the overall states. amount of illegal immigrants that i'm familiar with are supposed to be like 12 to 15 million and the numbers that people i hear people saying is that like the illegal immigrant population has like almost doubled in the past like three or four years i don't know if i believe that but um i haven't done like the really deep dive on the immigration border stuff i was going to but i'm i'm still doing like foreign policy so i haven't dug into this as much right now yeah i was really interesting that you didn't really talk about that with ben shapiro I really thought that that was going to be brought up because I think for the conservatives right now, that's the <clears throat> biggest concern, honestly. And you see other people like Bill Maher, mm-hmm. you know, especially when you have these people, these like four illegal immigrants in New York that beat up all these police officers and that was caught on video. Mm-hmm. People are now saying, OK, these guys got let off Scott, like without bail. That makes absolutely no sense. And then certain things are getting approved for. I think it was like. I don't know the exact amount, but it was in the millions, tens of millions, maybe over 100 million um, for 
visas with $1,000 credits to be dispersed to a bunch of different illegal aliens. And then a lot of people are saying, okay, well, it appears as though they're taking care of these immigrants more so than they're taking care of the citizens. I Normally, and again, I can't speak to those things. I haven't looked into that. But normally when you look into these things, they never are as they're reported. Mm-hmm. Like, I figured so. Yeah. But if it so is, I would have to, I would then have to, it would be concerning. Yeah, it would be. But it almost never is. When, it, when a story seems like too sensational to be true, when you actually look into the details, it's usually not. But I haven't looked into those, so I can't speak to them. We'll do our best to fact check what I just said. Okay. But it would be interesting. And I would like to see your take on that. Okay. Can we talk about business and finance? Sure. So we talked about this last time you came on the podcast. And this was actually, interestingly enough, some of the viewers' favorite section of the entire podcast. Because I feel like it's very rare that you talk about this, aside from like policy and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um. I want to know how your revenue has changed since you last came on this podcast and if the sources of revenue have changed, like where you're getting it from. Well, YouTube is a big one. I have like a contract now with Kick for streaming, which is also a big one. So the contract, you're still not able to disclose that contract? Probably not. Probably not. And then YouTube, so. I've noticed that like your YouTube channel seems to be like exploding. Yeah. Currently. Do you have any idea why that may be happening? Because I'm awesome. Um, I try to go on a variety of platforms. I'm usually pretty entertaining on a variety of like different Mm -hmm. areas so I can like plug in with a lot of different audiences. And then I think my political point of view is a little bit refreshing because I can give you a unique take on things from my perspective. And it's not just here's what all the progressives think or here's what all the like the centrists think or here's what all the conservatives think. Um, Yeah. What about the pay difference between Kick and YouTube? Um, Well, I mean, the Kick thing is because I have like a unique contract with them as an individual. Uh, YouTube AdSense is just so good. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know who really competes with that right now. So what percentages would you say are coming from these sources? Um, well, Kick now is probably more it's probably more than YouTube for wow. sure. Wow. Yeah. Then YouTube revenue in totality. Yeah. Is that revenue or profit? Because I know that you have Both. the clips channel where you pay the editor fifty percent. Mm-hmm. Which a lot of people in the comments thought that we were saying that that was not a good thing that you're paying like your clips channel. It's because really we were just, high. Because we were surprised it because how much can you say uh your clips channel editor is making? Why well, I negotiated them down now to 43%. So 43 down from 50? <laughs> yeah. So what's that look like revenue-wise? A lot. What do you mean? A lot? You I want... think last time you said it was like 50K a month. Um, It's probably a little bit higher than that now. Yeah. Around that, yeah. <laughs> that's that's really... That's, and position. that's your main channel? Is that your Clips channel? That, no, no. These are for all three of my channels. So you'd say now that yeah. Kick is actually a more significant portion of your revenue than than YouTube? Yeah. And how are you spending this money? Uh, it goes right into my investment account. And what do you invest in? <laughs> Um, I'll either I'll buy meme stuff on stream because I'm like I have oh shit sorry I have strong feelings about this particular thing for some stupid reason it usually works out really well oh really Um, yeah like I bought god I wish I could remember it I think it was like a year and a half ago I bought a whole bunch of meta because Mm -hmm. um, oh good because I was like it dropped like what like 20% or something it it had a huge drop and I was like did it really did I really feel like it lost that much and I'm like nah I bet people are overreacting so it always be like dumb that's the logic are are you still that's the logic are you still holding on to meta stock no I dumped before the 20% gain oh Um, yeah um, it was it was a huge I like my investment massively be the S&P 500 so I was happy with that Um, how much did you throw into meta I don't remember. It was like three or four hundred thousand. I don't remember. But um, three you put in three. Because I well, because I'll deposit a bunch of stuff from my checking account to my like uh, investment account, and I'll just like buy a meme stock, and then after a year I'll be like, oh cool, I beat the market, and then I'll sell it, and then I'll put it into like a S and P five hundred, like VU, like VO. What if you or, don't you know. beat the market? What if it underperforms? Do you still sell it, or do you just keep it I'm until? Probably, it... I'm gonna be honest. Yeah. I'm like five for five on my okay, retar- you my on stupid. Wood, man. No yeah. way. Yeah. Well, but it's all gambling at the end of the day. But like, I if but I do lo- five for five, well, it depends when you started. Like you gotta. Sell the last year and a half, everything picks. is basically yeah. Well, last I talked about it all on stream because it's funny because I'll talk because usually because when I bought Meta, it continued to tank for a while because I I want to say I bought it like one like sixty. And oh, I think it, it might have dipped when, below a hundred. It, it did dip below yeah. hundred. And, yeah, and everybody in my community is like making fun. It's like, no guy, we're gonna hold tight. Okay, where are my bag holders at? We're here. Yeah, and then yeah, with by the time I saw like a year and some change later, man, I don't remember. It, I don't, it was significantly beating the S&P 500, so I felt good on that. So what's I did the, down before the 20% big increase yeah. like yesterday, but yeah. So what's the next stock you're buying? Do I you just buy one? It's just yeah, total meme you shit. Just it's meme that. shit. You should never Fa- copy. I didn't think Facebook meta was I bought, a meme oh, stock. Oh, I bought like 100K, I think, in, um, in that Anheuser-Busch shit because so many conservatives oh, are like, yeah. I'm going to dump this stock. That beat the S&P 500, barely, but it did. I just have, So I have like the screenshot of that. I just want to post to like fuck oh. with conservatives. But. So you are telling us earlier you didn't like a lot of financial YouTubers. You felt the advice that they give is bad. It's always just like some meme generic shit like invest in real estate or something fucking random. And I'm like, oh, well, what does this even mean? I don't know. So, or, or like crypto or... So what would you like to see more of? More of? Yeah. Number one is college. 
go to fucking school. Really? It is incredibly Ooh, no. important. Wow. If I could give one piece of advice to myself growing up, it would be to study more. God Are damn. You yes. Is it absolutely? Actually, and you're not being serious. I'm not joking. Here. I can't tell if you. If you're can, it is like the easiest path towards like securing a job and get, or moving your way towards a career, it making like a big investment more, yourself. But more, what about the studies, man? What studies? More businesses, Zip more businesses yeah, are, are hiring people without a bachelor's degree. It was something ZipRecruiter now, it was like 50% of businesses didn't no longer require a bachelor's degree. For what jobs? For their jobs on ZipRecruiter. Which ones? This, Nobody's this getting an, an engineering overall. job without a degree. Okay, Nobody's that's, oh. STEM. that's STEM. Sure. So I would agree with you. I okay, think I'm sorry. If you want to be like the manager at your local franchise Wendy's, you probably don't need a STEM degree. Okay, but what or about any all degree? The, like, the arts degrees? What about them? I feel like there's plenty of coding. A lot of tech jobs. No longer require the bachelor's degree if you're proficient in what you know. Here is the here is the camps. here. I'm so sorry to yeah. hurt your feelings if you're listening to me. If you're if you want to get into software development and you don't know if you should go to college or not, you absolutely should go to college. The people that get those jobs that didn't need to go to college are people that are already working on stuff. They're like highly driven. They do like all of their own research. They work on programs and, and they work on projects. And when they go, they you know they might price a little bit for the tech interview, but they like they pass the interviews. They've got like work they can point to and they they're proficient. If you're just some guy who's like 18, you're like well. I heard that I don't need to go to college and then you like do Python for four years and you make like one stupid program and you're like oh I want an interview like you're not getting hired from anywhere you're not getting a job I okay, feel like, I think yeah. that's a whole different argument I think we'd probably be in yeah. agreement because we yeah you and I yeah. would advocate if you're in STEM you should go to college sure. just generally speaking broad strokes here you yeah, should go to college if you want to study STEM same thing goes for things like coding although I'd probably recommend a coding boot camp because it's a it lot like less expensive and specialized yeah. rather than taking all these undergrad random units like I had to take history of jazz that gets me nowhere and costs me it a bunch of It rounds you out as a human being. And if it's costing Why you a bunch of money, it's because be... you're going to some stupid fucking private school. You should just be doing either community know, college for two years or a state school. Time. If you're not making you're money, you're studying something you're going to be Why eventually doing. You're rounding yourself out as a human being. How is it a waste you of time round... to know more about the history but of jazz? But you could be rounding yourself out in the, in the world. I don't I'm the remember. saxophone player in college. I, I Fuck you, jazz is important. Jazz single thing Jazz is America's most important contribution to the entire world of music, and you don't care to learn about the history of it. All I can remember from that class is Duke Ellington. That's it. Don't even, yeah. I can't even name a song from him. That's okay. At least you, you know, know the name. You know how much time I spent sitting in that classroom and how much money probably went in that, even though it was community college. <clears> Could have been an actual university, and so it would have been the opportunity look, you're doing fine right now because you're a well-rounded human being. Not thanks to jazz. I dropped out of college. It was the opportunity. shouldn't have. It's the opportunity cost of wasting four years in a school just to go through the motions, just to prove that you, you know you. Because I just feel like you're being told what to do, it's and expensive. you're not thinking for yourself. Yeah, welcome to every and, job in the world. Being told what to do and not thinking for yourself. How many jobs do they like, give you the creativity? You're not going to be in a Facebook playroom where they give you like Legos. You know, like let's see what projects you guys come up with today. Like, but look at both of us. Both of us are in a very creative field. We're, we're not like told the one percent of the one percenters, though. But not who's everybody to say can be... you, you can't do that. The reality, most people can't. I feel like people can. Okay, if they, I, if I they, agree with yeah. you. I think I think to to accept the fact that like everyone could do this job would be kind of lunacy. it's the difference between like anyone could yeah. do this job, but they not want, everybody. But not everybody they could want, do this job. I, I believe if someone really wants to do something within within reason, most people can accomplish. What you they haven't want met to a do. lot of NCAA athletes who really think that if they try hard, they can go to the NBA or the NFL. I or think, whatever, no, but, like, the, but that was my exception. You know, obviously, like I can't play in the NBA. Maybe. But I just uh, think you when know, people go to college say, yeah. and they start studying things that like communications and they just like, ah, well, I just wanted to go to this college, didn't know what I wanted to do. And I know I could get in with communications. That's not going to take them anywhere in life. And they're probably going to have $100,000 worth of student loan debt. First of all, if you have $100,000 student loan debt, you are exceptionally indebted. OK, what is the average student loan debt? Isn't it like 30, 30 grand? grand? Yeah. OK, so if you're 100, you've already fucked up. Number one. Number two, I agree with you. Going to school and being aimless is, is dumb and you shouldn't do that. But better to be aimless in four years and have gotten a degree than to be aimless from 18 to 22 and then what? Get a normal job, knock somebody up and then just be fucked for the rest of your life? You're but never th going back to school. What are you going to do? That's what you're saying is the only alternative. And that's not what we would advocate Wait, for. Wait, what would you advocate for? If you're not going to college? Yeah. Figure out what you're actually interested in and then actually go pursue that. Okay, that's 1% of people. You're telling me that the, the problem is people draw from different groups to make these arguments. The person that goes to school and is like, I don't know, I want to major, I didn't take one class. That person, okay, don't go to college, is not out of college. And they're like, I'm going to take a one year coding boot camp. I'm going to be totally fucking driven. I'm going to study every fucking day. I'm going to remember. Every... But that's that what... person who's capable of doing that would probably just go to college. Right, and but the reason is because every, the, the NPC bots, they think that college is the next route, okay? They think that college is the next route because that's what they've been learning and yeah. impressed upon since they were growing yeah. up. But if only 
we maybe had a little bit of a change of culture of like, oh, you want to get a job after college. Maybe you try this alternative route. Maybe you do this instead of just the natural yeah. route being just go straight to college. And people just like, I'm going to do it. Don't know what I'm going to say. Don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to go to college. If you Take don't know debt. what to do, to get work experience in anything. Work experience. If the culture, I'm saying the culture anything. needs to change. Any experience. You if could, you got you could four work years as an apprentice, of retail experience, an apprentice for who's going to take an apprentice in high school for a good job? Anybody. You could, you could. Who? No, no, they're not. If, if, you're not, if, if you're, you're going to college, year old, if you're going to high school, listen, if you're, I gonna, if you're going to college, yeah. you need someone to support you, right? And let you, or you have to get work experience to pay for the college. So in a lot of those cases, you could say, I'm going to intern for this person. I'm going to be this person's assistant. I want to try this career. I could go to this trade school. I could get my real estate license. There's so many licenses that you could just get Why on you want your to, own. Real estate is for people that fail law school and trades are for <laughs> people that couldn't school. make it to college. Why would you? No, why would the you trades, the trades are fantastic. No, they aren't. They yeah, suck. Why? Why do trades suck? Because they're worse than college degrees I by know. definition. I they know. pay less. They hurt your body more. The I, hours suck. They It's more demanding I, work. It's less creatively like free. Like, I've, what do you mean? I've heard a lot of trades pay very well. They like don't. You plumbers, heard lies. You heard lies from people. Here's what happens. Why are they lying? Because they're assholes and because they feel strongly about the profession. Here's what happens. Some asshole will come on and is like, yeah, I'm a plumber and I make 250K a year. That person is not a plumber. That person is a small business owner that employs plumbers. It is never the case. Yeah, you're looking it up right now. The trades do not for? average on median. Okay, median, These... median annual wage. This is 2021. Okay. Also, so it's a little bit uh, wind turbine service technicians. 56,000. Sure. That's an ultra specific part of like a trade. I doubt that you like tile and stone setters, $47,810. The the ultra specialized trade things that you're talking about are not going to be trade jobs that you get going into the trades and working for two years. So what trades are are you talking about? These are, well, no, that person that's probably doing that probably started doing other types of trade work, but you've got to build up to that for 10 or 20 years. Floor layers. You could say the same thing about a doctor. Yeah, but having to security system installers. But generally having to do that work, it starts off with less pay. You're pay her right yeah, like you're college you're not earning anything for four years no so because by the time because you would have graduated college now you could be a specialist yeah and when you're pulling something back on a slingshot it's not getting any closer to your target the whole point about college is you're doing an investment in yourself you take on some early debt to increase your lifetime earnings potential and if you look at the median wages of almost any college degree over a lifetime of earnings it's like a million dollar difference yeah, but between couldn't that be because they're the type to go to college to begin with that they would have done well regardless then no. they had they had the ability to sit there focus Get a I don't job be, done, do I'm, a task. Yeah, I don't want to be a mean person, yeah. but for a lot of people, life just works better on rails. There are a lot of people where I think it's the exact opposite, where if you take a person, and I know people like this, where they, it sounds so mean because like we, we have like the dream job of like, oh, you're your own boss, you blah, 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 which is cool and it's fun. I like that. You too, yeah. I'm, you must like that if you do this as a job. But there are people who it's like if you throw them into the wind, they are lost. They're not going to like fucking self-direct and figure out what they need to do for work or to grow the book. But if you put them like in a but certain see, environment where you're like, here's your job, here's your task, they exceed. I think, they do I think really the well. problem is that the type of person to watch this podcast is not the type of person who wants to be on Rails. Just the fact that they're listening to a financial-based podcast makes them the exception. That's what I like to think and tend I to see. I super disagree. And I, would, I would fight you to the death on this because people will say things like, like that's more delusional than the every single person that thinks they have ADHD has ADHD take. Like I think that a lot of people like the idea of like financial independence and being their own boss and blah blah blah. But the at the end of the day, that's stressful stuff. Like not knowing where your next paycheck is coming from, having to chase down your own leads, having to create your own opportunities, not having a guy to just tell you what to do. That's an incredibly high level of stress. Some people, I think, the exception, like less than 5%, are super built for that. You, I'm, you guys probably are. I know that I am. I'm Because you guys do podcasts and everything. You must be, I would imagine. Uh, but for a lot of people, that is incredibly stressful. Right, but that's for being your own boss. Like we were talking about just certain trades and other jobs that didn't necessarily require a college any, any path that's not going to a traditional four-year college. Uh, yeah, I would you, say if like, you don't if, you, go, if, if you, you know what you yeah. want to do for a career, you snipe it and maybe the, the snipe, you know, you got to go through college, with, which I think is totally fine. Mm-hmm. But if you're going into college and you just have no idea, you're going to be taking all of these undergrads and you're just going to be past killing time, essentially. I understand. And that could be the case. But that person that might go to college and have no idea 
if they just spent four years doing nothing except for working and had no idea, that person is in a much higher likelihood of destroying their life than the person that goes to college for four years. I know, years. but the, the thing is that the culture says the only normal route that people should go on is straight to college. But maybe if we shifted the culture a little bit more to like, hey, there are other alternative options where you don't have to take on so much debt and spend so much time going through the system, then I think that it would actually make sense. I think if there were yeah. other stronger alternatives, I would agree. But right now, like that path towards going to college, getting your degree. I feel like it's getting less course. and less prestigious. Like the college degree is no longer this barrier anymore. It seems like it's become so common that it's lost its meaning. It, you know what else is common is GEDs, but we wouldn't tell people to drop out of middle school. I mean, yeah, college degrees are common and they're ubiquitous, but I mean, that's because the level of education needed. The American worker is more productive today than they have been at any point in history, right? Like the level of education, everything you need for a society today to participate in the economy is getting higher and higher and higher and higher. So of course, degrees are becoming more and more and more the norm. I just, I agree that there are paths that you can take that don't involve college that will set you up for success in life. But I don't see any like regular general things that I would just push a bunch of people off towards. Like, I oh, think it's consider- up to the individual at that point. That doesn't mean anything. Everything so. in life it's- is up to the individual. But the reality is I we think- can look at data, we can look at numbers and we can see like on average, like, you know, how do you perform if you go to this area in life? How do you perform if you go to this area? How do- you know, if you get a high school degree, you're probably going to be fucked. If you go to the trades, you do better than high school. If you do a four-year degree in college, especially in STEM, you're probably going to be doing the best. But if you're outside of STEM and being a lawyer and stuff like that, I just know that like so many people in my own personal life, because I'm kind of at that age now, 25, where a lot of my friends family, et cetera, have just gotten out of college recently. And they're kind of just like, okay, well, what do I do if they don't have a STEM degree? Well, then they probably have rich families. Fuck them. Let them study what they want and have fun. If you want to go and be an English major or a history major or an art major, I mean, if you have passion for that, then do that. If you go to school and you're like, I'm going to be a history major and you come out like, God, I can't find a job that pays me 85K, 95K a year. You're probably fucking retarded. I don't think they have passions. A lot of them are just like, they're 18. I'm going to go to college, kind of bum around for four years, figure out what I want to do. By the end of it, I might know what I want to do. Well, what would they have done in the they... interim? Like, what would they have done outside of college? I think they would have magically stumbled into their passion. Okay. I, I think they'd understand more if they go into the real world and get actual experience. Working. But, like, what experience? Like, uh, we talk, like, when you guys talk about experience, I feel like you guys ever read the Odyssey or, no. um, or the Iliad? Mm-mm, it no. sounds like you're talking about, like, these heroic journeys where it's like, get your backpack on and go and travel through all of Europe and work a collection of odd jobs and all these different places. And, like, at the end of all of this magical excitement and adventure, you'll discover who you are. The reality is at 18, if you don't go to college, what that usually means is it's time to go find a bullshit job and start working for the rest of my life. Because w- what other experiences? But you could try bullshit jobs in different careers and say, you know what? Maybe you say this career. is the one. What are the careers? I'm thinking like you work at McDonald's <laughs> and then you go and you work at fucking Walmart. And you. what are the career jobs you're getting at 18, 19 with no experience? I like to think that you could be anyone's assistant. What does that mean? Let's just say you want to be an artist. You could find an artist in your area and say, hey, I, I just want to work with you, see what you do. I'll do anything for you. I I talk a lot about doing this. This is what's worked really well for me. And if you're going to be in college, chances are you're going to spend your time in a classroom or spend your time actually doing something. So if you spend your time working with someone or in an industry that you want to be in, you could determine pretty quickly if you like it or not. I think that would work if you're a really hot girl and you're trying to intern with guys because they'll hire you or have you be their assistant because they want to fuck you. But other than that, Realistically, I'm just trying to I think. Like, I think passion and yeah, enthusiasm I, are something. I, I, I mean, really, really, I'm sorry, but for Graham, it worked not, for me. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to sound like disrespectful towards younger people, but like passion is a dime a dozen. I don't give a fuck about passion, and I don't think anybody that works well gives a fuck about passion. What you care about is what have you done? So show me a portfolio. Are you reliable and on time? Can you return an email in 24 hours? Are you like actually a reliable person that could show up where you need to be? And then like, yeah, what, what can you do for me? I don't think a random 18 year old showing up at the doorstep of like a 30 year old musician like I really want to help an intern or whatever, unless this guy got like anything in his past like maybe you jack didn't have anything in his past jack just cold emailed me as like hey i want to come work several times over the course of several months i was very persistent constantly showing up at the top of the inbox and then finally yeah it was like six months of emails what was your why did you hire jack well, he, yeah, he didn't it, hire me per se. Yeah. He just said, hey, I have all this like extra Jack? work and I just want to offload it. And I said, give me anything. Let me provide value. And I just inserted myself kind of in the business. And yeah. that was that. What was your, how did you email him? What were you offering? How did I email him? I offered him literally anything. I was like, I, I mean, I think I mentioned in the email, like, yo, if you, if you want me to walk Ramsey, which is his cat, or pick up Ramsey's poop, I will do yeah. it. Just tell me one thing. I live an hour away. I could drive to you. Do whatever you want, whenever you want it. And I'll just provide value. And then finally he got back to me and yeah. he wasn't the only t- person that I hit. Like I hit three creators in total and I sent each of them several emails. What, another creator got back to me. So what do you, wh- and why did you say yes? Uh, a lot of that was his persistence. I saw six months of emails 
And he was at the top of the inbox at a time where I was really trying to offload this work. And I was offering people in my office at the time, will you help me with this work? I'll pay you 20 bucks an hour. No one did it for like two months. And it was building up. I saw Jack's email. I was like, I'll do anything. I thought, you know what? Let's put this to the test. Will he actually do it? You want to do these Facebook emails? Let me know. Jack was like, yes, I'll do it. He finished it overnight. And then after that, I saw his work ethic, how quick he was. He was very responsive. And I said, you know what? I'll take you to, to dinner. Let's talk about it. And I really appreciate your help. And then from there, I gave him all these other tasks. I was like, okay, you know what? You did well on this. I had this other thing. Do you want to go through my emails? I just pick people who you think would be good on my second channel. Yes, absolutely. I'll do it. Okay, here's what I'm looking for. Just let me know. I understand once you've got yeah. initially in. Yeah, I don't know. I have hundreds of people that email me for stuff like that. I would never just take a random person. Like I would need to see like well, what I have think you done they might in the be past. Shooting what... up a little bit too high up the ladder. In fairness, at this point, like I think if if you're gonna try to find a mentor oh, yeah. mentee I, I, relationship, I think you need to go like a few steps ahead of you rather yeah, than just I shooting for the stars. I had at the time like five hundred thousand subscribers, which was big. But small enough where I was still doing everything 100% myself. So every email was like me reading it personally. Mm -hmm. But that's also how I got like everywhere, every business I've ever gone into or every bit of work I've done has mm -hmm. been just purely asking. Sure. I, just and, I mean, it's yeah, I think the same it's, thing, a mentor-mentee yeah. relationship. I reached out yeah. to H3H3. He sure. had millions of subscribers at the time and he'd get back to me. Because his inbox was probably yeah. flooded with yeah, stuff like that. I'm sure I'm, it's possible to do this. I just don't think it'll be the norm. Like how many people emailed you asking to help? You said he was at the top of your inbox, so there were a ton of other people asking to help. Probably, but so he was but, one of. But how you know many what? But you know what's failed? funny? I get yeah. some of those Instagram ones where it's like day one of asking Graham for blank. Day two, they'll give up on like day ten. But but you think if they went to day one hundred, you'd be I like, do. I am going to hire you? No, not hire. But someone's like day one until Graham calls my cell phone, or like I, I'm not talking about hiring somebody based on a hundred DMs, but I'm talking about a low level lift till Graham comments on my YouTube videos since Graham calls me like a minor lift thing and they'll give up after like a week, week and a half. Like when I started working as a real estate agent, I would go to open houses every single Sunday for months just to talk to other agents. And it if took you, months. Okay, I'm And curious. someone offered me, it was like, hey, you know what? You want to come work under me? Go for it. Okay, neither of you have children, right? No. If you did have kids that were like 15, 16 years old and they were thinking like, I think I might want to go to college you would say at 18, actually, I think what you should do is you just start emailing a bunch of people to see if you can work on it. No, them I would say, what do you want to do? What do you want to do with it? What is a college degree going to give you that you can't go and do right now? What What is the barrier that a college degree is going to help you overcome? And if they say, well, I want to be a lawyer and to do that, I need to pass the LSAT and to do that, I need it. Absolutely. You want to be a doctor. I need the college degree. But if they said, you know, what? I don't really know. Um, the college but, is just pushing yeah. off that well, decision or, of what yeah. am I going to do to a later date. Yeah, the other thing, if they came to me and said, hey, you know what? I want to go to college because it looks like a lot of fun. And I want to go because I want to be around a whole bunch of people my age and we're in the same. Then at least I understand why. But if it's, I don't know what I want to do and I feel like this, you know, everyone else is going so I should go. I would really say like, why do you want to do this? Is it just be everyone else you're conforming? And if they weren't sure. They're like, I don't know what I want to do yet. Hopefully I'll figure it out my first two years or whatever. You would say, don't do that. You should. I would I would see if there's an alternative. I would say, if you don't know what you want to do, what do you, I feel like as a parent, you would know by age 16, 17, where their passions are. Mm -hmm. Are they really good at something? Do they hate math? Do they love science? If they, if they love science, is there a field in there that they want to go into? Does that require a degree? I'd really try to narrow it down for the person. The idea, but, I think, is being intentional about your decisions rather than just kind of following the norm and thinking that that's going to be the solution to your problems rather I don't, than like actually. Yeah. So I don't disagree with that ever. Intentionality is always good. And I think if you're intentional, there might be some paths that aren't college that are better than just wasting time in college. I don't disagree with that. I just don't like the idea that it feels like when we talk about not going to college, we're talking about a whole group of people that are kind of like lost in college. And then we say, well, if you just don't go to college and you do something else, you'd be so much more successful. That's probably not going to be the case. Mm -hmm. I think I think if you're kind of not sure what to do after high school, this is what I would say. For the group of people that aren't sure what to do after high school, they're probably better served going to college, even if it takes them five years to get their degree, than to just start working right out of high school. Because the 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 fear or the possibility of getting stuck in the rat race when you're 18 or 19 and then never being able to revisit any other opportunity, I just think is too scary in my opinion. But 
Because life can set in like really quick to where now you're one year out of high school, you might have a relationship, you might have kind of like a job and it kind of pays. So now you're cut off from like a lot of financial aid. You're already out of high school for a year, maybe two. Now you're 20. Do you really want to go fucking study again and do homework and blah, 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 blah. And now you're 25 and maybe you've got a kid and it's like, you're not going to apprentice. You're not going to do internships. You're 25. You're working. Maybe you're like the manager at some, you know, supermarket or some bullshit. And now you're just, that's kind of the rest of your life. There is no like go back. Like when you're 18, you've got this really unique opportunity where it's the only time in your life where you still get to exclusively study, exclusively invest in yourself, not have to worry about like working a job, taking care of a family or any bullshit. And if you want to not do the college thing, that's fine, but I think you have to have a really, like a damn good idea of what you want to do as an alternative. It's better to wander aimlessly in college than it is to wander aimlessly outside of college and then to never, ever, ever have an opportunity for a degree. That's my take. But. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I think if you're one of the 82% of students, mm -hmm. pulled up the statistic, mm -hmm. that goes to to college and doesn't study STEM, you should really consider what job you're trying to get with whatever degree you're pursuing. And I think maybe if we remove the stigma, uh, the taboo idea of not going to college straight after high school and pursuing some alternative career and maybe like, you know, maybe providing more information and, and routes that you can and paths that you can take in your life, I think it would be a lot more productive. Okay. Yeah, speaking of working, uh, what are your thoughts on the FIRE movement? Uh, what is that? Financial, Financial independence, independence, retirement, retirement early. early. Grinding away in your 20s, early 30s, saving religiously to be able to retire by 35. If you enjoy it, Go for it, I guess. Some guy said something to me that I thought was really fucking stupid, and I had no counter to it. And it was really interesting. Is I don't, I was talking to some other, it must have been a streamer, YouTuber guy, or something. And I think we were both like in our late twenties. And I save a lot of my money, just cause, not even because I'm a good saver. I just don't spend much because mm -hmm. I don't need much. Um, and this guy blew through his money like crazy. And I just remember asking, I was like, are you not worried that like once this whole streaming shit ends or whatever, that when you're like 40 or 50, you're going to be like completely bankrupt? And the guy was like, uh, I probably will be. I'm probably going to run out of money. Yeah, probably like a decade or two or whatever or earlier. And I'm like, okay, is that not like worrisome to you? And he's like, well, why the fuck would I want to have fun in my 40s and 50s when I could have fun right now in my 20s? And I wanted to say like, what a stupid thing to say. And I actually had no response to that whatsoever. Mm. So I don't know. I think there's like good arguments on both sides. If you want to do that grind away and, you know, the fire stuff and be financially independent, retired by 35, 40, that's cool. But I mean, your 20s and your 30s and hopefully your 40s, like are, these are unique, fun, cool times in your life. And if you grind all of that away, like working like crazy, I don't know. Is that really worth it? I'm not sure. I think it'd be up to an individual to decide that. Yeah. What do you guys follow on My that? My experience has been it's it's been 100% worth it. Like for me, my 20s, you from don't 18 count. to what? Because he okay. finds enjoyment and purpose I in do. work. Yeah, because I'm do, doing fire. But, yeah. I, I could retire right now, but I'm not I'm not like a, a grinding away my life. Right. I love my job. Every fucking day I love my yeah. job. But if I was like trying to go for a partner at a law firm or if I was like doing, you know, hospital related stuff or if I was like just grinding hard, small business, like working every single part every single day and I really hated my life, but I've got to make it to 35 or 40 to yeah. retire. I think that's fundamentally different. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I just feel like there's nothing in my 20s that I couldn't do in my 30s. Here are the things that would scare me is that one is health related stuff could crop up still a minority but like in your 30s you're more likely to run into some stupid like chronic pain or some like chronic condition or whatever that starts to inhibit your ability to have fun a little bit that would be scary minority people mm -hmm. not a big deal but the second thing i think would be your incongruency with other people in life and i think that would fuck you up the most be my guess so for instance if you're in your 20s and everybody else in their 20s and you're all kind of like having fun and goofing off and being a little irresponsible you all get to do that together and then when you get to your 30s you're all kind of like getting more mature and then you get to do that together i think it would be kind of weird if you're like 33 i'm 33 two and a half million dollars okay in my investment account i feel really good in life i think i want to like slow down and chill right now and then i look at my friends and they're like well we just had our second kids we just got another mortgage in the house life is really stressful right now we had all of our fun 10 years ago it's time to grow the fuck up okay graham we're busy we're trying to live life now and you're like okay well i want to have fun now i wonder hey yeah how do you do you ever worry about that or how he would you wants to be that? the one no. 30 year old in a visa yeah okay. all the college kids yeah then you go to the college parties then you yeah. go okay yeah i i agree 100 no, percent with yeah. you i think mm -hmm. like i always question why am i working so hard at least on the things i don't enjoy i'm yeah. very much the same as like both of you where there's a large portion of my work where i absolutely love it mm -hmm. and there's a very small portion of my work where i'm like okay i really like it stresses me out it's like the 80 20 thing yeah um and i question myself why am i working so hard for this to make money what do i want the money for to be able to live a life that i could currently probably be living like mm -hmm. playing pickleball a couple nights a week like hanging out with my friends playing poker and stuff like that that's this type of stuff i enjoy and i don't want to sacrifice that now because i'm just working so hard to be able to eventually do that 
that down the line. Yeah. I find that you find people who you're in the same spot in life with, though. Like you mentioned that, uh, you know, people are settling down, having kids, not being in the same spot. But from my experience, and this could just be through YouTube, that it's less about a person's age and more about like what they're doing with their time right now. So I gravitate towards the people that are in the same place as me in life, regardless of if they're 22 or they're 62. Yeah. And I mean, you can do that if you don't mind that. But for more conventional work, I don't know how people would feel because I agree. Like the average age of the person that was like coming through my stream and shit is like fucking like 24 or something. These people are all chill. How old are you guys? 33. 33? 33. Usually five. Oh, 20. yeah. You're a kid. Okay. I can barely even send a look at you. Okay. <laughs> Jesus. Um, but yeah, no, like everybody's like super young. So it's, um, I don't know, like if you were in conventional work, grinding away like that, if you could very easily be like 33, 35, have a lot of money, and then go and find a bunch of like 20 to 25 year olds who are kind of like ready to like chill and, ha you know, hang out and have fun. I think it would be kind of off. Yeah. Yeah. I found a lot of older people mm -hmm. who are in the chill mode, like, and older people, I mean, in like their 40s. But uh, it seems as though no matter where you are in life, you could find other people who have the same interests and are in the same spot as you that you could relate to. Sure. Here's like another question I would have, two, two other things. Um, one relates to like dieting, okay? Yeah. So I think that when it comes to like putting together a good diet, if you're like, if that's something you're trying to do, I think rather than having like the pain, horrible agony diet for a few months or like a diet where you have to have cheat days, like find ways to make a healthy diet that's like fun, um, but healthy. Like that's easily doable, right? Get rid of like super processed foods, like the ultra high carb shit, um, the super sugary, like just like really dumb shit like that. Um, and, and you can generally put together a diet that is like, it's fun, but like it, it's healthy and you have like all of your needs kind of met. I feel like the fire stuff is similar. Like, is it not possible to work and spend in a way that's like responsible in terms of your finances, but is like you're still working hard, but you can also like have fun. Wouldn't that be like a better way to go through life it rather is. than to front load all of your stuff and then hope to read the rewards? It is, the, but, and... but then you make a balance between do I say 50%, do I say 30%, 20%, 15%. If I, mm -hmm. if I say 15%, I have to work an extra 20 years. Is yeah. that worth it? You just find a trade-off. Sure. Because then my second question would be for you, um, for you two, especially you, do you think you'll ever, do you think you would ever actually retire early? Maybe. You think so? I do. Okay. Yeah, the, but for, like the pod, I keep going back to this. The podcast is something for me I could do for a very long time. The main channel, probably give that up at some point. Okay. Uh, travel, I would love to do. I'd probably, I like tinkering on things. I like collecting things. I like hobbies. I think you really enjoy the podcast right now. And if the podcast were to die out and you decided to quit your main channel, eventually you'd get this urge again. Like I think most people do where you're just like, okay, I want to start working on something. And that's just it. You yeah. just currently only have the podcast, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And back true. in the day, you probably thought, oh, I could do this main channel thing for a really long time. No, I knew I knew immediately. Immediately that you'd have to oh, stop. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. That, that's why I was so careful about saving it all because I just thought this is not going to last forever because I've been watching YouTube since like 2009. Damn. And I see the lifespan of creators. Like YouTube has been my TV since then. And I see, okay, creators got big. Mm -hmm. The last two, maybe two, three years. I was going to say, done. yeah, three, five years is like your upper yeah, limit for the average. Yeah. Exactly. So, and then I saw some creators are having more longevity. So mm -hmm. I thought immediately going into it, best case, five to seven years. And that's like if everything goes right, five to seven years. What about real estate agenting? Did you feel like you could do that forever? Um, I didn't want to. Hmm. So, but I loved it. I loved doing it, but I didn't, I, I hated having to, for, not like, I hated needing a sale to happen. So I hated the going into it being like, if this deal doesn't close, it's going to ruin my day. And like, you know, I'm not going to be able to save it. I hated doing that. So every deal I closed, it was like, okay, I'm going to pretend like this is the last money I'm ever going to make. Mm -hmm. And how can I make this last for as long as possible? And that was my reason for saving. That makes sense. I think I, I agree with you. I, I, you guys just draw the line differently on the yeah, spectrum so. of, okay, how much yeah. you're supposed to work, how much you're supposed to save and play and have fun. So um, really, the, the type of people that I feel would be driven to do that fire stuff, I feel like are the type of people that wouldn't be happy to be like, ah, oh, 35, I'm done with everything, time to chill. But I could be wrong. Like, I feel I like those people would always be driven to do yeah, stuff. But I've been on the financial independent subreddits all the time, and mm -hmm. it does seem like it's split evenly in the middle. There are some people who had these hobbies, and they quit their job and they retire to something. Mm -hmm. And there's other people who have just always been working and then they quit because they can. And then they're aimless and depressed and they have no idea what they're doing and they're sad and they just go back to work. Huh. So I, I really, it seems like a 50-50 split depending on the type of person. Is there anything else that financial YouTubers are talking about that you don't like? Um, 
I feel like the basics should always be stressed. So your IRA contribution should probably be maxed out if mm-hmm. you're trying to save. Uh, 401k matches absolutely are yeah. what you're going for. Um, and then uh, if you're trying to figure out like, whenever people are trying to figure out like living expenses, people focus on income, I think sometimes more than outflow. Like making a budget is probably one of the most important things you can ever do when you're trying to control for financial anything mm-hmm. if you don't know where your money's going. Um, and then otherwise just like boring... So it seems like we're on the same because that's exactly what I talk about. So it seems like okay. when we're talking about like financial people, you're more so referencing the hustle culture. Yeah, the hustle culture, like crypto, all that shit. Then, then those, yeah. are, those are two entirely different segments of like okay. finance YouTube. Yeah, gotcha. Like the Gary V sort of, mm-hmm. you know, work, work, work. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you this. If you think there should be, because we're talking about spending money, progressive penalties in terms of yeah i love you do this so yeah. this this came up when i saw in another country someone norway. got it yeah was it the eighty thousand dollar speeding, speeding ticket, ticket? I think, yeah it was either norway or finland i think i think it was norway yeah so how much I, money did they have it was based on an income of like 10 million dollars a year like 20 million a year yeah fuck them and so but but apparently it was only going like eight miles an hour over the limit or something like that but that was the 80 grand so i heard you talking about before if someone goes and gets a speeding ticket here in the United States, 500 bucks for someone who's working minimum wage, that'll screw them up mm-hmm. for like maybe half a year and their insurance rates will go up. It could be a devastating thing for someone with money. The $500 speeding ticket is just you're going to basically rip it up, give it to a, a lawyer. I haven't gotten a speeding ticket in a long time. Are they 500 on average now? Uh, I got one recently. How fast are you going? I was going allegedly. Allegedly. Allegedly, they said I was going, uh, I was in a 65 going 90? faster than 60. No, no, gosh, no, no, no. It, it was not, no, allegedly. 100? No, no, it wasn't that much over the limit, allegedly. It was a 65? It was in he a 65. He wrote you the ticket going to 79, didn't he? It was, it was something stupid. It was something stupid, but anyway. What state am I in? Are we in, Cal- we're, we're in California. We're in Nevada. Nevada. $500, damn. No, it wasn't 500 That That oh. one was like 370 bucks. Oh, okay. But then you also have to think of, you know, if if you opt for traffic school, then that's another 80 bucks on top of that. So all these little things that add up, you know, it could, it could be close to $500. Okay. So you like progressive penalties? Yeah. I did too. I've never heard about that until when we were going over our questions before you came over. And I think that's actually, it makes a lot of sense. I think it's weird that you could pay to like not have <clears throat> shit bother you. It seems kind of strange. The same thing when goes. To like criminal stuff, yeah. I feel like for for the legal system, honestly, mm-hmm. people that use the legal system as a weapon against other people, especially if you're like punching downwards, I feel like you should suffer oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the same way that other people are suffering. Well, the legal system is highly flawed because if if you're somebody with money, you could basically write out any lawsuit and you could allege anything you want to and the other person has to pay to fight it. I mean, kind of. I mean, there's vexatious litigation. If you've got a good law team, you can get stuff like you can do motions for summary judgment and say that this is a bullshit court but case. That, there are some but, protections against that. Yeah, how much is it going to cost to get to that point? 20 grand, 15 grand, depending on the case? That's a heavy you retainer know? for depending on the type yeah. of case. But I mean, like, hopefully five grand or less. But I mean, I agree that, like, yeah, the legal system can be weighted in favor of, like, more wealthy people for sure. Absolutely. That's undeniable. Yeah. Yeah. It's just not as hopeless as people make it out to be. But yeah, I think it's kind of weird that. Criminal stuff especially can be reliant on your financial means in terms of your engagement with the system and how likely you are to come out good on the other end. That's yeah. not cool. It's really about hiring, I guess, the, the best lawyer that you can. Yeah. To just argues better than the other lawyer. We had uh, a divorce lawyer on mm-hmm. who was talking about how he wins cases against other inexperienced lawyers just because he's so much better. And the people that could afford to hire him know that he has a higher success rate because of that. Mm-hmm. You're going through a divorce right now. I'm done with my divorce. You're done with a divorce right now. I I heard divorces could take a very long time. No contest divorce, like two weeks. Really? You just sign the papers and send them to a judge and they look at it and they give you a judgment and you're done, yeah. And you had a prenup? No. It was was a short marriage. It was like less than five years. So So what does that mean if it's a short marriage versus a long marriage? A longer marriage, there's going to be a stronger case to be made for alimony, uh, but it also depends on... If the earning potentials of your partner was hurt, so if they stopped working, or if you've got children or shared assets or anything like that. Yeah. You were in an open marriage, which means each partner can sleep with other people and have these like kind of micro relationships with other people. A lot of people were speculating that it would eventually fail. What is your response to those people that say, what did you think was going to happen? I mean, most relationships fail. I had four monogamous ones before this open one, and they all failed. <laughs> 
That is I mean, true. It's, most but relationships I guess, fail, But I guess yeah. the difference was that you weren't mm. married to those. I was past... married to my high school girlfriend. Yeah. I mean, okay. Yeah, it was, yeah. Got me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, most relationships fail. Yeah. The next relation, I mean, I can make a prediction. The next relationship will definitely be an open relationship because it's probably the only style I would do. And that one will probably fail as well. I mean, just statistically speaking, like, yeah, it will probably happen. Were there, but were there signs <clears throat> that it was going in this direction? Um, ahead of time yeah for sure but there were just things i had to learn about myself that i yeah would you have to learn about yourself um i think because of the way that i grew up i'm very much a uh like i have to do everything and i'm like very 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 independent and i always thought that was a really good character trait and i think it is for like business stuff but i think for relationships i think it's really bad Mm -hmm. because you tend to take um uh rather than ever assigning any responsibility or blame to my partner i would just assume that i need to figure out everything for myself and then i'm also like very not reliant on my partner for anything which i I also thought was like a benefit but it's not it just makes the other person feel like unwanted or unneeded go into that a little bit more because i'm i don't want to say i'm similar but i'm very much the same way where if something happens i deep down i look to myself and i'm like how could i have handled that because because you can't dictate another, what another person's going to respond with or do. And I, I look at that and like, how can I improve myself? Where did I go wrong? Yeah. And I like to think of myself mm-hmm. as like very independent and I don't want to like throw too much on my partner. So I think the issue here is um, every single piece of advice I'm about to give, uh, a lot of the people that say this are actually the most energy vampiric subhuman piece of shit bucks in the world. So it's hard. Um, yeah. It's like that whenever you see somebody tweet like, oh, like everybody around me always needs so much and I wish somebody would just like take care of me for once. 99% of the time, that's an energy fucking vampire, okay, who actually is the most like energy consuming, sucking person that doesn't help anybody else out except for when I can benefit them, blah, 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 blah. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. Maybe I am that person. Um, basically, Uh, I would get into conflict where it felt like my partner was able to justify every bad action they did on my prior bad actions. And I had done bad things. I'm not perfect. I do fuck up. I make mistakes. Um, But every time they made a mistake, it was because of mistakes that I'd made. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, well, fuck. Like, well, what can I do to change this in the future? Like, can I do this? Or can I change this? Or can I do that? And every time there was a fault that was my fault, like I, like it's my fault and I'll do what I can for it. Um, And then I'll see what behaviors I can change. But I, Never could like tell my partner like, hey, can you not do this or can you make this change or can you stop this behavior? Because then it was like the end of the world. So but that was I set that dynamic up because I'd gone through the whole relationship, never being able to make make any asks for anything in terms of behavior from the other person. And it kind of, yeah, not was not good, I think. Yeah, got it. So in a new relationship, you're going to be more outspoken uh, yeah i just have a hard time need. asking for things from people i kind of just okay. like meme and joke even professionally sometimes i've gotten better at it recently the past like two years especially but i'll kind of like if somebody's making me uncomfortable i usually just like meme or joke it off right. or it's whatever until they reach a breaking point and then i cut them out of my life completely and for a lot of people that's really confusing because they're like okay well hold on how did i just get cut out yeah. completely i didn't know i was even bothering you and it's like well and then i'll say something like, well come on you should have known this is obvious but then when i think about it, it's actually not obvious because i laugh and meme everything off so it's like people yeah. don't actually know did this come out of the blue for you um no i don't think so no 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 is there anything you would have done differently leading up to the situation that happened um like getting divorced or no i'm talking about maybe you you could have done something prior to then that maybe would have had a different outcome or you could have saved something i think my general behavior in the relationship of not like putting like very um not being able to make asks for things or accepting or tolerating certain types of behavior um that i were are probably not okay i guess so like having like there i need somebody that shares my values in terms of what's important and what's not important in a relationship i guess yeah and if somebody doesn't share those same values so for instance like trashing your partner to another person to another friend that's something i traditionally would never do that and i need somebody that like is aligned on that and if i let somebody else do that and i'm like well they view things differently than i do whatever that's probably not a good thing i think yeah okay you seem to be very matter of fact about it how did it affect you personally or emotionally going through something like this was it really challenging because it it's kind of weird hearing you talk about it in such a i would say nonchalant way yeah my emotional baseline is just really 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 high so as long as i'm not like my life isn't fucked if i go to sleep i wake up i'm usually a little bit better you know every day and i just kind of yeah keep going i got do you ever wish you had more emotional variants Mm, I don't think so, maybe. I'm not sure. I've talked to a few people, Dr. K, a couple other people about that. I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if I miss some things in life because my emotional variance maybe isn't that high, but I don't think so. I think I'm doing fine. Because being super sad Mm -hmm. can be a really pleasant experience, oddly enough, because you can find the beauty in the sadness. Maybe. I mean, it's all part of the experience. Fuck that. No, I don't think so. You don't think so at all? Fuck that. No, it doesn't sound like fun to me. (laughs) Interesting. Um, Like watching a sad movie. 
Yeah, that's definitely. I, I would that, say that's yeah. kind of like a proxy for what I'm saying. Okay, then I do sadness by proxy. Then okay. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I I respect the the emotional baseline. Do you think that most people have more control over their emotions than what they think? Probably not. Most people probably have less control over their emotions than they think. That's pro- that's true for me. I think there are times where I'll just be a fucking dick, and I'm just being just not a not a fun person to be around. And then I'll like eat a meal, and after I eat, I'm like, oh shit. I think I was hungry for like the past six hours. I feel so much better now. Hmm. Uh, I'll go back to my chat and unban like six people that I banned because mm-hmm. I was just like in a fucking whatever mood. So yeah, I, I think that most people's moods or vibes are impacting their emotional state more than they realize sometimes. The chemical reactions going on in the Yeah, whatever's happening there. That's really interesting. I, hmm. I'm i more of a proponent of like, I think people can force feeling whatever way, nearly at every given situation. Obviously there are certain um random statistical anomaly like bad stuff will happen and you'll feel Mm -hmm. sad but i think for the most part like if you feel yourself being very impatient with something you just have to like have an instant of gratitude and you can force yourself feeling more positive about it i don't 100 percent disagree i would qualify it a little bit like you can have like feelings and then responses to those feelings and if you enact like certain behaviors or if you try to have like certain thoughts in response to feelings you can slowly change the feelings i think like that yeah there's like a feedback loop there that if anytime you feel this way about a particular person or thing you just think like okay maybe this isn't the best where I need to view this a little bit differently. If you do that, that process, I think over time can change your thoughts. Yeah. Was there any financial impact of having a divorce? Um, no, just good. I just have to worry about myself now. I would say. Yeah. Interesting. So it wasn't like expensive. You didn't have to pay out anything. I think I paid like $2,000 for an attorney and all the filing fees or whatever. Yeah. That's really fascinating. Was it no but- contest divorce? I mean, it's super cheap. Yeah. You hear a lot of people say, oh, you're going to lose half. Yeah. Most people are fucking retarded. Why would I, you should never lose, losing half implies there's a whole bunch of, first of all, only 10% of marriages, the end of them even involve alimony. Um, division of assets is probably a good thing. You should be dividing assets. You probably should be losing half because you're losing half your partnership that you use to acquire those assets, right? If you're a man and you work and the only reason you were able to afford that house because a wife stayed home and took care of kids, then yeah, of course she should be entitled to something. Like she'd sacrifice her entire career and enabled you and empowered you to go and work that job. I mean, I think you should, yeah. Do you regret having a relationship so public? No, everything in my life is public. And would you get married again? Um, I don't know. I'm not like a big marriage guy. We got married yeah. because she needed the green card to live in the U.S. because I don't want to have a long distance relationship. That sucks. Right. So yeah, but I'm not like a huge marriage dude. And hopefully, I don't have any more European brides. So you know. <laughs> and you think the next relationships that you get into will be open? Almost for sure. Yeah. Almost for sure. Yeah. I still can't help believe what I mentioned the first time you came on the show, which was I feel like the standards for levels of attraction and love and intimacy are just lower for the people that have open relationships. Because I can't imagine myself, I haven't been this way my entire life. I don't plan on being this way for the rest of my life where, you know, I find somebody and I'm happy to share this person with a bunch of other people. Like, I feel like I just kind of want them for myself and I want them to want me for themselves. Okay. What do you think about this? Sounds the super boring. Standard. I don't even think about like the I want this person to want and... me for themselves. It's like not like when I'm with somebody, I'm never thinking like intimately. Like God, I'm so happy that she just wants me and not anybody else. Right, it's just the, not like a thing the, that's ever in my head. I but guess. But the reason yeah. you're not even feeling that in the first place, it's like these deep emotional feelings about somebody else. That's what I'm saying. There's like a deeper level of intimacy or connection. What does that have to do with whether or not they're with somebody else when they're not with you? I think what Jack's trying to say is if you had like maybe a deeper connection or a deep, yeah, deeper. Yeah, I'm saying like I think that yeah. the connections are slightly more shallow in open relationships because of what is okay for, for it to happen in a relationship. Okay. I mean, I could just say I think the connections in monogamous relationships are way more shallow because if that person is with anybody else, all of a sudden everything you feel about that person is like now held at risk. Hmm. I, I don't think I need necessarily any shallow or less shallow. I think just different people have different approaches to relationships, I guess. I don't know. Do you love your child less if you have a second one? I don't think that that's necessarily the same thing. I didn't say it's the same thing. I'm just saying that like when when I when I'm with somebody, if I really love somebody, there's a lot of things that I'm thinking about for why I love this person. It might be the way that we spend time together. Uh, it might be some level of like physical attraction. It might be some level of like sexual and romantic chemistry. Mm -hmm. It might be like their sense of humor, their ambition. It might be like personality traits. It might be hobbies or things we do together, but it's never my life. Is it like, I'm so happy that they're not going to be with somebody else when we stop hanging out. That's just not like a thing that I think about much. Hmm. And if it was, and if we were just together and we weren't hanging with anyone else, I don't know why that would make me like them anymore or I would care anymore about that. Right. I, I would say it's mo- more so like the sacrifice that each person makes to the other person. Why would I want them to sacrifice that? 
Uh, because I think it's a part of the of the relationship. That I think. sounds horrible. <laughs> Why would I like what if I what if I found out that my partner every morning for 30 minutes like stuck like needles into their nipples and like every day like God, I'm so happy you did that sacrifice. Like, why would I want them to sacrifice? I don't know. What is it? I don't think sacrifice is good in and of itself. I, th- I think it's the idea of putting someone else else above yourself. So I think in most relationships will say you'll both make sacrifices to be in that relationship. And if you give a little, you take a little, it shows that you value the other person. Yeah, but the goal should always be to minimize the sacrifice. I don't want my partner sacrificing more than they need to, right? Like if I'm sick, I'd want them to take care of me, but I don't want them to like clean up like all my shit around my apartment because I'm a child and I can't do anything for me, right? Like whatever sacrifice we're making should be in service of something that we feel is important. If you think monogamy is important or sexual exclusivity is important, then the sacrifice is, yeah, I think good or respectable. Mm-hmm. But if you don't care about that, then why, I don't know, I wouldn't. Like sacrifice isn't good just because it's sacrifice, right? Like I could go out right now into traffic and sacrifice myself and die and you'd be like, what the fuck did you do for? It's like, shouldn't you be grateful? I sacrifice for your podcast. Yeah, I sacrificed myself content. for the podcast. And it's like, well, you didn't actually help with anything. You didn't do anything. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I suppose for me, I just think like, if I'm in a relationship with someone, I want them constantly choosing me over anybody else. So technically that would be an open marriage, but they're just not executing on the openness of the marriage. You know? I think any relationship is technically open because you could just go and leave if you really right. wanted well, that's, to. That's but, like, but then you if end you the cheat, relationship. Everything is an open relationship. Yeah. <laughs> but then you end the, but at the sacrifice of ending the relationship. Sure. Mm. I think I think there's some level of people wanting to feel like they're the number one choice in every regard for their partner. They might want to have that feeling. So the exclusivity is really important because it reinforces that. Yeah. Where do you think morals come from? Probably the same thing as the political beliefs. We inherit them from our social groups, basically. The social groups. Mm-hmm. So if you're born into a Christian, Islamic, uh, you know, American family, like your morals are going to suspiciously resemble basically all the people around you, probably because that's where you get them from. Yeah. So when did you start adopting your current? philosophical and moral beliefs was that influenced by your environment um probably so i grew up like very catholic Mm -hmm. i went to a catholic school until i graduated high school um around 15 16 i started to kind of like pivot towards atheism and when i became atheist i started to read a lot of or i read two books by ayn rand and i noticed afterwards that i was like full-on like this is the smartest person ever i'm like a card carrying objectivist like this is the best thing ever i love this so much and then i realized after like six months i was like okay well hold on Uh, i just ditched my religion and then i read one author and the first author that i read i happen to agree with every single thing they said and i want to follow her to the ends of the earth i'm probably just a stupid kid i'm probably just like believing whatever the fuck stuff i read so i need to like take a step back i need to not let other people like influence me so much i need to figure out like on a fundamental core level like what's important to me and then once i've kind of like ironed out these fundamental core beliefs then i can from there start to like extrapolate these into the political world around me basically yeah or the social world around me i guess yeah so i try to be relatively independent but i mean invariably i'm going to be influenced by whatever video games i'm playing movies or anime or tv shows i'm watching or the people around me the country i'm in and everything as well right like there's no way that it's just by chance i happen to be like an institutionally supporting uh social democrat who believes in liberalism and free market capitalism and also a you know a person that lives in the united states of america so i mean we spent the last three months carefully crafting this this right here is a tier list of political commentators and we want you to fill it out okay tier list how like who gives the most insightful political commentary who's the funniest who's the most just recommended? overall overall your thoughts about this person okay yeah so it could be accuracy, comedy, everything, good faith, yeah. bad faith, etc. Oh, yeah. Do you yeah. want to pull that closer? You could just so pull the laptop? computer closer. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. fine. Alex Jones. <clears throat> We've got deplorable behavior for Sandy Hook. Uh, factually inaccurate all over the place. Um, you know, all around horrible contributor to misinformation. Also pretty fucking funny. Pretty meme I would say he's like a, a A to S tier in terms of comedy. Uh, he gave us the Kanye West interviews with that black hood and the um, net and Yahoo stupid thing. So all in all, I'll put him in a seat here. Hmm. I'll balance him out there. Okay. It was a big judgment against him for that Sandy Hook stuff. So um, is that Anna Kasparian? Yes. yes. Um, fiery political personality uh, on the Young Turks, though. A little bit far left for me. Um Tries to do her best. I give her props for that. I'll stick her up here on the B tier. Yeah. AOC, progressive. Way to the left of me. Don't appreciate that. But she's grown a lot as a uh, uh, lawmaker, as a congressperson. She's working better in office. Tries to reach out to young people. I can appreciate that. Except for the podcast, but... Well, you know. One day. AOC, how many, please come on our show. We would please. love to have How many you subs on. did you have when you tried then? Many times. We, we're still no, How many subscribers did you have when you tried last? 
Uh, 100,000? Yeah, something like that. What do you got I mean, now? 950,000? Get yeah. to a million and then maybe she'll think okay. about it. Okay. Yeah. I, th- I think Everyone a million is subscribe, good. Please. Yeah. Please. Oh, yeah. If you want subscribe. AOC on the podcast, subscribe. Thank you for telling him to subscribe, Destiny. There you yeah. go. Andrew Yang, too. Um, you should be able to get Yang on now, No, right? we tried. Really? Oh. Damn. Uh, ben Shapiro, you know, largest right-leaning, I think, mo- probably one of the most popular right-leaning people in the United States right now, if not the most. Mm-hmm. Um unless Tucker is still beating him with older people. Um, You know, but again, massive political disagreements. He tries to be fact-based, but these are my political enemies. Can I really put a political enemy higher than a C tier? I'm not sure. You could if, I think, I think you could if you, if you highly respect them. No, don't put that on me. (laughs) Don't put that on me. But you put him on the same tier as As Alex Alex Jones. Jones. Do you really feel that way? Well, think about it, okay? Ben Shapiro is more factual than Alex Jones, which he got downrated heavily for. But Alex Jones is a lot more entertaining than Ben Shapiro. Hmm. And Ben Shapiro doesn't really have like that hilarious entertainment factor, right? Like Alex Jones does. Number right? one chart rap song. Okay, well, if it was Ben Shapiro and Tom McDonald. You know maybe. what? His uh, review of the Barbie movie was fantastic. Was it? Yeah. I might have watched that. I don't remember. Okay. We don't need to influence him. Nah, that's fair. Bernie Sanders, you know, progressive. He tried his best. He got young people energized a little bit, but his whole campaign fell apart, and he didn't really do a good job of picking people that weren't extreme radicals, and he got crazies like Brianna, Joy Gray, and everybody after it. I'm going to put him on the seat here, but he tried. Is that the best president in my entire lifetime in the United States? My God, Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, the HEROES Act, bipartisan infrastructure legislation uh, pulled us out of Afghanistan, thank God, got us out of the uh, Saudi-led anti-Yemen coalition, uh, managed to uh, reduce our troop commitments in places like Syria and uh, Iraq, uh, is responsibly handling Ukraine. Oh, my God, just how, what's not to like about this guy? But he's getting a little senile. I'll put him on the S tier. Okay. Wow. Love this guy. Great president. Uh, you know what, Jenk, similar to Alex Jones, I like him a lot because uh, he, you know, I might put him down here because Alex is a bit funnier, but he's also he's on my political side a little bit more, and he comes on my show, so he gets big points for that. So I'll put him right here for the seat here. Chris is a really good guy. I think he's pretty um, entertaining. Uh, I think I agree with most of the stuff he says. I don't think I've ever heard him disagree. Or I, I don't think we've had disagreements before, but also I don't know where he stands politically. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll pu- I'll put him here on the A tier. He seems like a. I've yeah. never, I don't think I've ever heard anything bad about him or seen anything bad about him ever. No. Yeah. I thought I'm aware of. Actually, he's kind of suspicious. What? We have a good. Answer. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Is my hair blurry? Yeah. Um. Stephen Crowder. Uh. F tier. Uh. Constantly doesn't talk to me. Uh. <clears throat> is mean to his wife on video camera. Uh. Tried to blow up the Daily Wire. Failed miserably. Uh, on that stupid contract shit. Um, what? God, I'm just I'm just doing this so we have a better face cam because we're gonna superimpose the face. Okay, cam. fine, whatever. Yeah, fuck Steven Crowder. Far right, dumb, everything he does. Totally. Um, who's this guy? I can't see. Who's that? Jack. Don Lemon. Oh, CNN. Um, I don't have strong feelings. What is CNN? I'll put him on the seat here. Fuck it. Elon Musk. It's just all of his political takes are horrible. Uh, he did get me unbanned. No, not personally, but I was unbanned from Twitter. So hmm. I'll, he gets bumped up to the D for tier for that. Why were you banned on Twitter? No, it's and it depends on which account you're talking about. Oh no. <laughs> um, let's just let's just try to get this a little bit so you're yeah, Oh, okay, fine, cool. Um, who, who's this guy? Gavin Newsom. Oh Jesus! Why are these pictures so small? We had to, we yeah, had to it make is. it okay. small to yeah, have it okay. all fit. Uh, I just watched Gavin do a couple debates and speeches. You know, we agree, I think, on some things. I don't know much about the substance of his beliefs. I do know that I lived in California, and there were a lot of homeless people and a lot of taxes. And I think those two things should never go together. So, um, But he was really good on camera. I'll stick him here on the B tier. Okay. okay. Um, who, is that, who is that? <laughs> oh, that's Hassan Piker. Oh, Hassan Piker uh, supports terrorists. Uh, champagne socialist, uh, just bad political takes on everything. Can't read more than a Twitter thread. I mean, what do I? What is to like? If I could make a lower tier, I would. Jesse Lee Peterson. Uh, he's funny, uh, but also perpetually sounds like a stroke victim and has some crazy beliefs. I'll put him down here with Elon on the D tier. These guys would be good friends in real life, I'm sure. Uh, is that Joe Rogan? Yes. 
Um, a big purveyor of misinformation, but at least he brings a lot of people together to talk. Uh, and he's reasonably entertaining. Oh, I'll, I'll stick him on the C tier, I guess. Is he really going the same tier as Don Lemon? Uh, we'll bump, we'll bump Don up. Uh, you know what? John Oliver, uh, I think he's still the left of me, but I don't really hear him fuck up ever. I think last week, tonight it's generally a pretty good show i don't think i've ever heard them I, listen i watched their israel palestine stuff and i thought it was actually like pretty good which says a lot in this environment so you know i'll put him on the a tier I, yeah i appreciate him jordan peterson you know he talked to me so he gets big points for that but um man he i just feel like he's off the deep end right now with the all the crazy stuff he believes so i'm gonna put him on the c tier as well kamala harris i don't know what she does she's the vice president i feel like i've never hear anything from her ever She's visited, visited the border once. Cool. Isn't she, that's her department? Of the vice president is to visit the border over and over again? Mm, I think it was some other titles she had. I don't know. I saw on some stupid Twitter thread. Charlie Kirk is an idiot uh, and a loser uh, and believes horrible things politically. So he can go down there. <laughs> um, who is, it? is that Lex? Lex. 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 Hello. Uh, sets up amazing conversations. Uh, has helped me talk to people that I never thought I'd be able to talk to before, like Ben Shapiro, and then hopefully other people at the end of this month. Uh, you know, tries to bring people together. Uh, is a little bit, you know, too nice to everybody sometimes. But yeah, I'm he's up here. He's my S tier. He's fighting for a buddy of the year right now on my stream. Mm -hmm. Okay, so good job. Is that Vosh? Matt, Matt Walsh. Walsh. Oh. Uh, yeah, Jesus Christ. Man, Daily Wire talent that is not uh, Ben Shapiro is uh, in a pretty rough state, I would say. Uh, and here's another one of them. Yep. <laughs> uh, yikes. Knowles, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just, it's just like whatever you can say to like bash people on the left, that's like what these two do all the time. And I'm pretty sure these guys have both collectively spent like more of their career talking about how much they hate trans people than literally every other subject combined, which is just really wacky to me. Is that Fuentes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I will, I'm going to bump Fuentes up to a D tier. Um, I do like that. Um, Fuentes followed the exact career destructive arc that I said he would go on where he threw away the entirety of what he was building so that he can go hang out with uh, Kanye West for a little bit and then ruin the entire rest of his political future. And that was just very fucking funny to me. And I like the fact that I got to sit back and laugh and enjoy all of that. And it makes me funny when I see him and his Griper fans beg me to go on and talk to him over and over again because they know the only shred of relevancy they will ever have for the remainder of their political existence is if I give them any. So I'll give him a D tier for making me feel good about myself. David Pakman. One of the few people on the left that I feel like isn't completely and totally partisan brain rot to one side. Uh, we disagree on some things, but I think he tries pretty hard. And he puts out a lot of content. He does a good job. I'll put him up here. A tier. Um, Patrick Bet David. Huh. Well, I want to go on their show, so I'll put him up on the C tier for now. <laughs> um, these guys have a lot of crazy people on. I feel like they are very bought into the anti-establishment conspiracy crazy stuff. Uh, and I feel like I hear that a lot. But um, we'll stick him there for now. Who is this guy? RFK? Oh, God. Um, just crazy, wacky, conspiracy guy. Almost no redeeming qualities whatsoever. And every time I listen to him talk, I want to clear my throat like 20 times. Um, it's crazy. <laughs> oh, God. Russell Brand. Yeah, uh, Jesus. Yeah, my God. Like, take, like, Joe Rogan and just make him worse in every single way. And that's Russell Brand, basically. Um, less funny, less... Just... just everything less intelligent less and he has a british accent too just like jesus <laughs> how many more ways can you go wrong is this trudeau mm -hmm. um man canadians hate this guy and i don't like canadians so he gets a bump for that in my book um i'll, I'll stick him on the c tier b tier he can't go next to pvd i'll put him up on the b tier because we're like you know we're both left-leaning and you know he's a young guy uh, he beat trump at the handshake game so he gets points for that um yeah, I'll, he, he'll make B tier for me. Uh, Donald Trump. Uh, normally, I'd give him... Normally, I would give him an F tier because we disagree on almost every single thing um, that could possibly be disagreed upon. But D tier because he helps my career a lot because it's fun talking about him making money off him. But F tier because he's a treasonous fucking piece of shit and I hope he rots forever in prison. Uh, Tucker Carlson. I hope he rots right alongside Trump. Uh, treasonous people that betray this country and give aid and comfort to enemies of the United States, like what Tucker is doing right now as he interviews Putin and goes on the biggest, easiest softball suck-off interview of his entire fucking life. I know that's coming out. Fuck this guy. Um, and he lied to the American people, knowingly. He said he was lying. He doesn't like Sidney Powell. He thought Oliver 
theories were fucking insane and he's literally texting talking about how he hates that she won't actually verify anything they're saying but still supported all of it on fox news um fuck him um vosh here uh where's hassan at f f okay well vosh gets one tier above hassan because he's a little bit smarter than hassan um but that actually that means he should know better and he shits on me and he says so many incorrect things actually you know what he's an f tier f tier for lazy he doesn't hustle enough his channel should be bigger but it's not because he's lazy and he's complacent and he's making his million so he doesn't care fuck that guy vivek i don't think he offered anything of value he was just like a little uh basically a darker version of trump uh who was like less successful and less in every single conceivable way fuck vivek and xqc uh god tier political commentator uh obviously a uh, frequent call into the destiny stream believes in all the best things antagonizes the fuck out of people that i don't like like hassan so you know he makes the s tier as well you didn't put anyone in the amazing tier amazing no that guy's crazy <laughs> he's actually so, crazy now looking at this yeah do you still agree that all of those like you can see you know steven crowder's on the same level as charlie kirk as matt walsh as rfk as russell brand as trump as tucker carlson as vouch 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 mm -hmm. that all seems accurate when it, when you're now able to compare each person to the people there beside well you're also i'm half memeing on some of this but um yeah, I mean, like, a lot of these guys are purveyors of huge, like, swaths of misinformation. I really don't like that. It's one of the things that drives me the craziest. Um, and then the obsession over weird, like, culture wars issues I also think is, like, cringe. Bro, I was so bored of talking about trans shit for, like, all of 2023. It was so fucking boring. My God, kill me. Hmm. And I feel like Knowles and um, Walsh especially were, like, obsessed with that for a long time. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Cool. That was really fun to watch. Wow. Thank you. Anything thank else? you, yeah, thank Destiny, you. for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Is there anything else you want to mention? Um, no, I don't think so. Thanks for having me. It's been fun to chat. Thank you. We're going to leave a link to this exact tier list down below in the description. If you guys want to fill it out, you'll be able to do so there. Post it on Instagram. Tag Destiny. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so we yeah, can see that. what all yeah. of these viewers think. You could tag us, too. Okay. Oh. Thanks for coming on the show, Destiny. We really appreciate it. Thank yeah, you, Thanks man. for having me. Until next time. See ya. Yeah.